We are live Myth Vision Podcast. Your host, Derek Lambert. Today, I'm actually being, I got to do this right here. We're going to fix this. I'm going to say I'm being co hosted today with none other than the Apostle Paul, but he doesn't lie. This one doesn't. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Paul, Paul Legia, you just did a, um, outstanding edit. One of my favorite videos you've done. It's a deep dive. I've got an echo here from YouTube. Bear with me. Um, and I love the video and I figured nice. you and me could co-host yep. these two heretic scholars that That's have joined right. us today. <laughs> so welcome. Well, these are of the type. William Lane Craig has recently gone after us, which is a thing maybe we'll get to in the future. You and me personally. And uh, for, for you and I are harboring these heretic scholarships. That's kind of the joke that we're making is that they're, we're not they're not in the good class. So we're bringing on more William Leg William Lane Craig non-approved scholars. Right, right. Yeah. These are these are um these are the people that you won't hear about in the small ponds. And right. That's okay. That's okay. Cause they're in the ocean with the rest of the big fish and those uh, we might as well introduce. It's like, it's weird. We're talking about them and they're right there and we haven't introduced them. So um, I think I should put names up on the screen here for people to be like, who's that guy uh, that might help us. So welcome to myth vision. I have Brian and how do I pronounce your last name properly here? Blaze. Blaze. Wanted to make sure Brian Blaze what is your background? And then we'll get to Camille because he's been on the channel before. But like, I want people to know your expertise as we're diving into critiquing Richard Bauckham. All right. So my background uh, academically is uh, I have a physics PhD from Brown. And uh, and I uh, teach a number of different things at Bryant University that's in Rhode Island. Uh, so I teach physics. I teach AI and robotics. I teach um, computational biology, and I teach uh, some statistics, and so that's kind of how I got into this this uh, um, you know, this project, and and so I've kind of published on a wide range of areas from computational neuroscience, usually like in in, in vision, uh, but also in uh, paleoclimate, like you know what is what is a carbon dioxide 500 million years ago, uh, and also I have a paper on the zombie apocalypse and and how uh, uh, infectious zombies are in movies. Um, so it's kind of a wide range of different different things, and now now we can you know add uh, New Testament studies to to to, to some of to some of that. Um, in terms of my religious background, I was brought up Catholic. I kind of moved away from the church in high school school. I was somewhat of a deist in early college and then became an atheist in college. And generally, I, I am a big proponent in science education. And and, um, um, and so I look for ways to contribute to that to that area. So that gets me into uh, apologetics, but it also gets me into investigating uh, UFO claims and alien claims and uh, magnet therapy and miracle healings and, and things like that. Perfect. Perfect. So you and Camille work together um, publishing an article for those who don't know, just to share the screen. And then I want Camille to give us his background, his, his expertise here and what he did. What is this, Camille? Tell us who you are, what's your background and what happened here? So I'm, I'm officially a biblical scholar now. <laughs> uh, no, so I'm, uh, I have a PhD from, uh, in political science. And now I'm doing a second PhD in classics, uh, so uh, ancient history, stuff like that. Uh, and yeah, this is, uh, this is just the first article that we published. We have a couple of other articles, including some on Balkam in the pipeline as well. So uh, that's going to be on your channel as soon as it's published as well. Uh, and this, this one was a lot of fun. <laughs> it, it really is. Has anyone seen, I want to get a vote in the chat because I think it's only fair. Have you guys seen the video that launched one hour ago on Apologia's channel? If so, press one. If not, press two. I wanna see if you haven't. I hope you do once we're done with this deep dive because it's one of my favorites, personally. Paul, did you wanna comment on that? Um, um, well, what was fun about it <laughs> was that Camille like pitched me on this and I just, any any a chance to do this kind of level of scholarship on my channel i obviously love um but then camille and brian just came so prepared and with all the points and they they brought me 
they just brought me everything. And so this was so easy to put together compared to, to some of them. And it's so effective. But I also love that I had put in some jokes early in the thing. Camille was like, you're totally undermining our point. We don't need to entertain people. Just, and, and he was right. He was he was completely right. Uh, there was I was undermining points to, to be funny. So that I just, okay, good. We're, we're all about, we're just all about scholarship here. So I hope people love it because it was, yeah, it's fascinating. But yeah, very different for me. Well, I mean, the, the two of us, we we, we did uh, one video already. So I, I know the process. So next time we do that, then you're just going to have it basically turnkey, right? Um, you won't <laughs> right. have to do anything. You guys yeah. can do the animation. You can do the all the th all the things. And I will just... <laughs> that's that's going to be done by ChatGPT soon. So don't worry about soon it. Soon enough, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it was it was my pleasure, and I agree. Uh, among the scholarly ones, yeah, it's it's delicious. But you have to stay tuned here to find out why. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I posted a link in the chat. Um, if you want eternal salvation, like the real thing, not the one that the heretics teach, you got to watch the video and you got to check out the article. If you can mm. afford it, I sure hope you can. If you can't, look, you're going to get enough to whet your appetite here, but it just might make you figure out a way to somehow go to Brill and make sure you get it. So might be worth jumping on anyway because there's a lot of great articles on Brill anyway. But um, I figure the best way to start this conversation, you guys are going to have a presentation, but it, it's always important as we're leading into critiquing that we're still manning positions because people will go, you, you misrepresent how often do we hear right you don't understand we talk about undesigned coincidences you don't understand you know those are examples right you don't know no one knows undesigned coincidences like the undesigned coincidence crowd okay no one is gets it well do you really understand Rick, richard bockham's arguments brian and camille are can you still man his position or is that part of your presentation and am I stepping on your toes? Well, I mean, we it's not part of the presentation, but we actually did do that because um, so that the article is about, na is about names and name popularity, right? And he relies on a basically like a phone book of everyone that we know of from the ancient world who was like a, a Jew from Palestine, right? And the uh, that lexicon is covers everyone from like 330 BCE to 200 CE, if I'm not mistaken. So 500 years. That's obviously a long time. And it's not surprising to see said that like <coughs> during the half millennia that the lexicon covers, there were some ch like changes in naming practices. So some names kind of fell out of favor. Some became more, more popular and stuff like that. And Bokam didn't sort the names or filter names by date. So he just took everyone in that lexicon even people who lived, who were like contemporaneous with Alexander the Great, all uh -huh. the way to 200. And what we did, we actually took care to filter the names so that we are only comparing Gospels and Acts with people who are actually uh, contemporary with the events of Gospels and Acts. And it turned out that if you filter the data that way, the distribution of name popularity in Gospels and Acts fits the contemporary population better than if you just use all of the data, which is what Bolcom did. So we still manned his case that way. Uh, we wow. used like a subset yeah. that is a better match for, like it works better for his case. Is yeah. it fair to say, and I'm sure Paul has something to say on this too, like Paul, as you edited this, because what happens to me when I'm editing content for my documentaries, I'll script stuff. I actually learn what I'm editing deeper as I go. Would you say, Paul, as you edited this, you felt like that what, Bakum is trying to do is say these names prove historicity, therefore these people exist. It gets you one step closer to saying if the people exist, then the things that happened that they account for the people probably happened. So it's reliable. Is that what it seems to you? Um, for sure. I hadn't actually read Bakum's book before this, and I've now read that chapter, of course. Um, <laughs> but it is crazy. I, one of the things that came out of it was like how overconfidently he's making this case compared to how I'm used yeah. to hearing him in interviews. In interviews, he's very uh, like like you'd expect from a scholar, at least somewhat humble about results. And it's probably this, and it's probably that. There's some reason this particular issue for him, uh, he's overexpressing himself, and that was one of the things that I definitely saw when I was researching it. Also, just to delve into this uh, hundreds of years old lexicon 
and realizing that there were several volumes that came out after that um like just i kind of got lost in my own weeds that that camille and uh, brian sent me on definitely looking at looking at all these names and what was popular where and and i also um the dispara was a new thing for me i hadn't really thought i hadn't really been familiar with that i don't know derek are you familiar with that dispara? yes yes yeah that was I had, to, I had to because there was this really strange theological group called israel only and I'm not I'm not going to get lost in the details, but they were trying to argue that all of the Gentiles, all the non-Jews that Paul's trying to save are genetic ethnic descendants of Abraham that were scattered among the nations mm, since right. the Assyrian and the Babylonian conquest. Oh, my gosh. It lo it's pretty much the argument is these Israelites became a diaspora, lost their true identity, and Paul's trying to re- you know, get them back into their true identity and make them recognize who they are and all the it's it's a crazy thing. So it was weird fringe ideas that helped me to learn things along the way. <laughs> yeah. Like I saw like I just wanted to affirm that when someone like me gets this great opportunity when scholars come on and talk about these things, I can nod my head during the interview part and just like whatever. But then when I have to go illustrate it on screen, I have to go actually learn it for myself. And that is a joy. So thank you for that. That was awesome. I remember when I first read Bauckham's book and I remember getting to that chapter and my first, I mean, I, I noted how confident he was with very little data and that, that by itself, I was like, okay, something, something doesn't smell right here. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and so I was, and then I was looking at the data, it's like the data set is extremely small and, and he doesn't do any statistical tests. He's, he has all these kind of arbitrary things. And and just that combined with his confident language really made me go, okay, so, you know, this someone needs to look into this at some point because it's it's pretty detailed. But I think there's a tendency, I think, and uh, to what I what I call like argument by big books fallacy. And essentially, it's it's the have you read Bauckham's book? And if you haven't, then you can't comment on it. And the book is like you know 800 pages long or something. People do the same thing with Craig Keener's big book on miracles, right? They're, you know, they say you can't talk about miracles if you haven't read all of uh, you know Keener's uh, uh, miracle claims because maybe one of those is actually good, right? You know, in 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 there. And and so that that was one of the another motivator I think for trying to try to look at some of these things because you know the to, just to put out. Um, because we haven't seen any ma major responses about this particular chapter, and this is the most quantitative one. And people can get scared with numbers, and that's why you know it's you know, people just trust it. Be like, oh, he is doing numbers; he must it must be right. And and and, that, and I've seen that in many fields, and it raises my red flags. And I like to delve into it when possible. So I, I think we are already cannibalizing the presentation. So, so uh -oh. do we want to share the screen? Absolutely. And I just want to say right. it was a smart move having Brian join you on that, Camille, because <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. We need the numbers guy. We need you to crunch the numbers. <laughs> All right. I'm you're gonna share your screen, correct? Uh yeah. So I just uploaded the presentation into this into StreamYards. It's okay. processing. So if you have anything funny to say while it's processing, then uh, now is the time. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Uh, we, we we should have probably done that before because I don't know how how long it's going to take. Um. Yeah, you yeah. are a matrix kind of guy. You're, you're gonna get lost into this. So get your popcorn, grab your drink, whatever. Hopefully, um, you're ready for. Oh, there we go deep stuff so there we go cool so uh all right you can see it awesome awesome so sure so what is it that we actually did well we published some paper or whatever this is how it looks right um so let's just start uh everyone already knows that jesus and the eyewitnesses by richard bokam what what is the book actually about well he argues that um the Gospels and Acts, the canonical ones, are based on eyewitness testimony, not on what he calls anonymous community transmission, which is basically kind of the idea that um, stories about Jesus were uh, circling around, <clears throat> Christians were converting their neighbors, and they were converting their neighbors and stuff like that, and some things kind of got lost in translation, or they got invented, uh, because people tend to do this kind of stuff. But that's the overarching thesis of the book. Oh, this didn't line. Uh, this doesn't import correctly. Oh, that might be an issue. Uh, okay. It does so that? No, no, you know what? Go ahead and stop sharing for one second. All right. We're gonna fix this. Open up your PowerPoint. But you uh, know, yeah, okay. I'll How show do you. I stop sharing. Uh, here, I, I, I can stop. I can stop it for you if you'd like. Remove it. 
Um, All right. Let me, ooh, I can kick it from studio, but I don't know if it'll kick you. Let me try it. Oh no, it says kick guest. I can't do that. So if you, if there's a way at the bottom, um, can you move from studio? Okay, I can see. All right. So what this I'm time, what you're gonna do is open your PowerPoint and then go down yeah. and hit present. Don't do it into okay, Streamyard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just share your screen and then we'll do it yeah, that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So I need to do this. I need to do this, and I need to do this. Uh, so share screen. And which one? This one. All right. Can you see it? There you go. Yes, sir. Cool, cool, cool. So let's do a second take. So basically, uh, so it, you know, there, there's a number of arguments in the book. Uh, most of the stuff that's in it has been responded to by other scholars. Uh, but there's one chapter uh, on this name popularity argument that uh, hasn't been responded that much. They have there have been like one response in 2014 and then one actually early this year. Um, so we are like one of the the few scholars who have actually looked into the chapter. And the chapter looks at personal names in Gospels and Acts. And the argument it ba it basically makes is that when you look at people who show up in Gospels and Acts and they have a name, they are given a name, and you look at name popularity in that sample, it lines up pretty well with uh, name popularity in the sample of all known Palestinian Jews from antiquity, right? So th this is just like one way how to present the data across all of the names from Palestine that we know of. And you can see that like at, at the first glance, there is some kind of correspondence, right? So, so there are some uh, outliers, so some names are maybe uh, underrepresented, some are overrepresented, but you know, like it picks up uh, when it comes to like the line picks up when it comes to the the most popular names, and that is something that you that tends to happen in Gospels and Acts as well. And Bokam actually says that this uh, correspondence exists because the people who are mentioned in Gospels and Acts actually existed in history, and he makes the argument that if a lot of them were invented, then these two this correspondence wouldn't be the case because people who are inventing characters wouldn't know which names are appropriate to use and more importantly they wouldn't get the proportions right right so they would maybe use names that uh, Palestinian Jews actually had but they would use uh, a name too little or too much so there would be discrepancies right and because Bokam thinks that this correspondence can establish that the people the named characters in Gospels and Acts existed in history that like lends support to his overarching thesis of the book that the content of the gospels uh, was actually sourced by eyewitnesses. So, mm -hmm. so far so good. Uh, why did we decide it to look into it? Well, one reason is because the conclusion of the book is supposedly uh, the majority position in New Testament scholarship, right? So if you think that the gospels are not based on eyewitness testimony, you are in the minority, <laughs> At least uh, three years ago, there was a research, and it's kind of infamous for uh, re because of reasons, right? So Michael Acona had a um, had a uh, master's student, who Joshua Pelletier, who went through over two hundred um, works of he claims critical scholarship in English on the authorship of the Gospel of Mark, and uh, from nineteen sixty five, and apparently. Most scholars, more than half, think that Mark was actually the author of Mark's gospel and that Peter was his source. Hmm. So what Bokam says, at least from this data set, is actually the majority position. Uh, now, the obvious issue is that we don't actually have that uh, research because it wasn't published. It was a master's thesis at some university where Lacona teaches. And both Pelletier and Lacon actually refused to make it publicly available, which means that we can't check. We can't see whether they omitted any critical scholars, whether the sample is actually critical scholars or whether they have like confessional commentaries and stuff like that. We can't see whether the proportion of scholars changes over time because it's, you know, 1965 to 2020 or 2019. So is, is it, for example, the case that recently this proportion is very different. Uh oh. You're muted, Camille. You muted. 
You're muted. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. <sighs> yeah. Oh my gosh. He did y'all just witness that? Um, <laughs> please continue, brother. Please continue. That was tell me that wasn't hallelujah, right there. <laughs> Yeah, so so that that was that's one of the reasons. The second reason is that Jesus and the eyewitnesses is actually extremely influential, right? So, um, Society of Biblical Literature has a has a website that's um, like a database of every publication that comes out in biblical studies, and you can scrape it. So I just scraped all the publications that are in the database that were published three years before and after Jesus and the eyewitnesses, which is about two thousand and six hundred. And then I spent a couple of days manually checking Google Scholar and recording how many each public how many citations each publication has. And that because I wanted to see like what percentile is Jesus and the eyewitnesses in terms of how often it's cited in academic literature. And I was completely shocked because it turns out it's the fifth most cited. You, you have to control for how old it is, because obviously all the publications have had more time to accumulate citations. But if you actually look at only the sample of publications that are about the same age, it's amazing. And usually what happens in uh, academia is that there is like a correlation between how good the publication is and how many citations it has, right? So like, I don't know, forgery and counterforgery is very influential and it's also pretty good. Um, something like, I don't know, on the historicity of Jesus, not very well cited, not very good, to, to, to be honest, right? But Jesus and the eyewitnesses is like a massive outlier because it's been cited, like, I don't know, like 1,200 times or something like that. But not just the chapter that we did the article on, but also a lot of the other, other, other arguments in the book are like profoundly goofy, right? Another reason that why we decided to write the article is because almost everything else that in the book has been responded to. So, so this is like one footnote from the article that we've written that just lists some of the most important responses to Balkan. But one notable exception is the chapter that has the name popularity argument in it. No, almost nobody has responded to it. Where you can find it cited uh, is in apologetics and in New Testament scholarship that is like, that's leaning, I don't know, evangelical or conservative or something like that, right? So Craig uh, Bartholomew, for example, cites it. Um, Sean McDowell cites it, right? So those are the people who cite it approvingly. Um, it's based on hard data. So people kind of implicitly seem to trust it. So th this is just like one sentence from one review of Jesus and the eyewitnesses, I think from back like 2008. So the reviewer said, the hard data that is utilized definitely gives an authoritative tone to the discussion. Yeah, we'll see about that. Um, so not many people uh, kind of fact checked it. A lot of people seem to trust it implicitly. And mm -hmm. one, one thing that's, that's really like weird is that uh, Jesus and AI Witnesses has been released the second time. So the second edition was 2017. And the second edition is basically the same. There are some additional chapters. And the preface to the second edition was written by Simon Gathecol, who is also like a, a conservative New Testament scholar. And, and he specific, in the preface, he specifically highlights this argument from name popularity. And he actually says that he was in a church and the pastor was holding a copy of Jesus and the eyewitnesses. And he was talking about how this argument like establishes that uh, the gospels are based on eyewitness testimony because you have this like objective research based on actual statistical data, right? And not only did Simon Gathecol, I don't know, like proactively disclose this anecdote, he even asked the pastor to send him the speech of the sermon and he quoted large sections of it in the preface. So th this is making grounds in apologetics, right? And maybe the most important reason why I decided to write the article is because there is like a massive disproportion between how confident Bokam is uh, when it comes to what he says and what he actually does with the data on name popularity. So he doesn't do any actual statistical analysis. He just looks at some tables, basically. So he gets some onomastic data. We are going to talk about where he uh, got them from and what he does with it. But he just tabulates them. He looks at the 
tables, he kind of squints his eyes a little, he calculates some percentages, but he doesn't, for example, check uh, statistical significance, right? Which is something that you should probably do. But based on that, he uses extremely strong language to talk about what his data supposedly show. So data, which is limited and problematic, we're gonna talk about that, doesn't do any actual statistical analysis, but still he writes things like, simply could not have been, could not possibly have, impossible to explain. Oh, this is like a massive red flag, right? And not just me, but also Brian and some other people who have read Jesus and the eyewitnesses, like for them, this is suspicious. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, so that, that's like an incentive to look into it. Um, I had the same feeling. And when I found out, okay, nobody, almost nobody has actually looked into this, uh, maybe because there isn't like the relevant competency in biblical studies, right? Not, not that many people are competent in, in statistics, even though some are actually. Uh, so let's let's see if we can do something with it. And what we found out when we started looking into it was like, it kept getting better and better. And I, I think the uh, article actually turned out pretty nice. So uh, any questions so far? Everything clear? I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down. And I think this is good. Cool for our audience to cool. understand how you're leading into this. Yeah. And, and, so and just, where just the... so you guys know, Shannon Q says one of these guys, one of these guys, one of these, one of these guys. <laughs> 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 All right. Sorry. That was the break, the commercial break. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So, uh, okay. So wh where does the data f about main popularity come from and what does Bocam do with them? Right. So he actually relies on a grimoire or a, a necronomicon of Jewish names in late antiquity that was put together by other people. Uh, most importantly, Tal Ilan, who is a Jewish, uh, German Jewish uh, scholar that apparently she's been working on this for like 50 years now because she's here in this, she says she's been working on it for 30 years and the first volume was published in like 2002. So. This is basically, as I, as I mentioned, like a phone book where every uh, person that we know of in the ancient world who was Jewish and we know their personal name is recorded. It's like one row or one entry. And what you get is their name, uh, the source of information, so where the name shows up, that could be Ostraka, coins, inscriptions, ossuaries, literary sources, the, you know, like the Talmud, Christian sources and stuff like that. And some additional information about the name and maybe some caveats, like sometimes it's not clear whether the name is male or female. Sometimes it's not even clear whether it's a personal name because it could also be, for example, a toponym, uh, so like a place name. Uh, sometimes the person is uh, suspected of being fictitious, for example, depending on the source and stuff like that. So what Bokam does with this data is that he tabulates it. So he doesn't report the individual records, he just reports the totals. And what we found out right away is that I actually went to the library of the Jewish Museum in Prague, which happens to have all of the lexicon volumes, and I just tested whether if I take the lexicon, I will be able to aggregate and get the, sum, uh, the same totals. But I actually found out that I'm not able to do it and then, then I discovered that about one in 10 of every figure that he reports is miscalculated. So, so this is an example of one of his largest tables or the largest tables, uh, the table, it's the name popularity of male names. And all of the data points that are in red are actually incorrect. They are either miscalculated or in some cases you can see that the correct number is printed in a different column or row. So it's just something got messed up in printing or editing or something like that, which like, it would be fine, except the book has been out for 17 years. It got a second edition and this hasn't been caught and it hasn't been fixed. And why some do you think the, that is, if I, if I can ask, because- uh, Well, because, because nobody bothered to fact check it, right? Like <laughs> Bo Bokam didn't ask anyone to kind of go over his numbers. He definitely didn't ask any statistician, which is what I did, right? Like, that's why I, I wrote <laughs> Nice it to meet Brian. you, Brian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like peer reviewers didn't notice. 
the people who reviewed the book, uh, so so other scholars who wrote like reviews for journals, didn't know this. Uh, some of it was caught by some of the scholars who have responded to specifically that chapter, but for some reason, like nothing was done uh, done about it uh, when the second edition was published. And this is even though Bokam says explicitly there is hardly anything I would want to change in the text of the second edition. Right, but still in the second edition, the table says that there were four people named Eros in the New Testament. You know, and I remember when I read the book, like I don't know, ten years ago or something like that. And be be because I'm, you know, I, I did my first PhD in political science, and when you do that, you you learn some basic statistics, quantitative methods, some coding and stuff like that. So I was like super excited about the chapter because that's actually some like hard data, right? So I was going through the tables, and I was like. Wait, are there people named Eros in the New Testament? And I thought, okay, maybe like Paul in his letters, you know how when he closes the letters, he mentions some names who like greet the, the people of the community that he's sending the letter to or something like that. I thought there's going to be some people named Eros in it, right? But actually, no. <laughs> that's, just a, that's just a typo or like incorrectly printed, you know? Some so yeah, that's not good. Yeah, they get through peer review, I think, mostly because the effort needed to verify a table like that is is kind of huge. And and you might not have access to those, to that big phone book of, yeah. of Jewish names. And so you'll just be like, yeah, you know, I, I trust this guy can count, right? And that's pretty much what you're what you're doing, which is generally pretty low bar in, in, in these sorts of things. Uh, but, you know, ideally peer review, someone tries to make sure to reproduce these sorts of problems. But uh, but I can see there's this, you know, you get this basically a big page of numbers and you're like, okay, how do I fact check this thing you know, if I can? And they just focus on what he says about the numbers rather than the table itself. And, and yeah. just to add and I, one I, more I, thing to that, Camille, yeah. is that you're suggesting in this, it's not just that numbers are off, like maybe there's miscalculations of the actual names, but that in this case, that's completely erroneous. This is in this situation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you, you can see how something like this would happen, right? Because clearly, like, four, the number four is the total. But for some reason, it got printed in the column that corresponds to numbers in Gospels and Acts, right? As well as in the, the column that reports the total. So okay. that happened, okay. And again, like, this, this, this doesn't mean much. Except it's really unfortunate that this is in the book for 17 years and the book got second edition and this hasn't been fixed, right? So, so to what extent is a, for those of us who aren't in academia, to what are, I know how, I kind of have an idea of how papers are peer reviewed, but are books peer reviewed in the same way or does, or is peer reviewing a book yeah. mean something different than peer reviewing a paper? This, the, so this this is kind of a, I don't know if Brian has some experience, but this is kind of a dirty secret, where it, like from my personal experience from from political science, yeah, like when you're writing a book, the even though even when you want to say okay this book was refereed or peer reviewed, usually the criteria are, are much more laxed, and it's usually because the peer reviewers are handpicked by the author. They are not actually, uh, it's not actually anonymous peer review, right? So for example, when I was publishing books in political science, I was told you need to find like two people who are going to peer review it. So I just uh, asked my like friends, uh, other PhD students and stuff like that. So so I don't know like what, what, what exactly is the status with Jesus and the eyewitnesses. If it wasn't peer reviewed, that would be super unfortunate given how like influential the book is. Actually. It, I think it comes down. Sometimes it's 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 the the publisher. So so different publishers may have different levels of review. Uh, the other thing, kind of the practical point of, if you peer reviewed a book at the same level that you peer reviewed papers, then it would take ten times longer. That's right? exactly so what I was saying. Yeah, it's right. eight hundred pages. So right. but something yeah. right. So something technical like this. And I have like, you know, so so uh, one of the books that I uh, published with co-authors uh, as a graduate student um, was kind of a summary of research that had happened over many years. And so each chapter, although it had a little, you know, some extra, it was based off of a paper that was peer reviewed through typical journals. And so it had, it's less likely to have this kind of mistake in it because the core content was drawn from actual 
from from peer reviewed journals. And so that also means that the, the reviewers for the book don't have to do quite as much because a lot of it's already been peer reviewed. Um, and I don't know whether this is, I mean, th this chapter in particular, it seems to me to be the, the perfect kind of pay, like, uh, thing to, to have published separately as um, a, as a, a journal article. I don't think it has, but that's the that's the case. So, um, yeah. but it does, and it has another problem though, that because he, there are these massive kind of typographical errors, it is literally impossible to reproduce his his results because we can't reproduce the, the percentages that he gets. We can't reproduce in, in a way, either for the Gospels or for like what he's comparing it to in terms of Palestine. So so one can always make the claim that we haven't reproduced his result, but but because of these errors, it is literally impossible in detail to uh, to reproduce his, his result. In in uh, but but we can actually kind of improve what he he did. So in that sense, you know, where we are uh, um, trying to you know, essentially make you know correct these sorts of errors. Yeah, yeah, that's that's actually a good point. So like we we couldn't we I, this is something that I found out like uh, in the first week of working in this into the, uh, working on this. I realized that we can't just use his numbers. We actually have to go back to the lexicon and we have to start from scratch. And kind of build it from from ground up, uh, yeah. And just full transparency, the the journal article that we've published, that's be, it's been out for like I don't know oh, two weeks now. And since it was published, I I've already noticed three things that are incorrect in it, and actually that actually makes me super pissed because I've read it like ten times. Brian's read it several times. It, it's gone through peer reviews, peer reviews. They were like proofreaders and stuff like that, but still there are things that we didn't catch, right? Um, so I that love happens. that you're pointing out about your own article about yeah. the, now there are obviously errors as you described earlier that aren't detrimental to your case, but like, it's yeah. like, it has, it's irrelevant to the case itself, but like, it's, it's interesting that you're pointing out, yeah, I made these mistakes and like how even you are pointing out how the process is not, Oh, I had my stuff peer reviewed. It's, when you hear that, that what yeah, does that it's mean? Not you know what I mean? Yeah, it's it's never a hundred percent. Yeah, you you can read it a million times and still you'll just get you, you get blind to to your own content, right? Yes. But let, let let's move on. Sorry so we we also need to talk about what he does with the names, right? Because he his sample doesn't actually have an everyone in it. He filters some of the people out, uh, and the reasons are like valid. But in some cases, the application is, is questionable, right? So he's got uh, the population of ancient Palestinian Jews, and he's got people from Gospels and Acts. So obviously, when he, he needs to put together a list of named characters so that he can kind of see how well the distribution of name popularity lines up with the contemporary population. So obviously, first thing that you need to do is throw out non-humans, like Satan, angels, and stuff like that. You need to throw out people from a thousand years ago, like David, Solomon, and so on. Then he obviously only uh, looks at Jews, which means everyone who isn't Jewish goes out, including, for example, Simon, because he's uh, excluding Samaritan Jews, actually. Uh, then he only looks at people from Palestine. So everyone who wasn't born in Palestine but was born in the Jewish diaspora is also excluded. So, for example, Apostle Paul is not in Balkan's sample. And th this is super important because uh, uh, obviously the one region in the ancient world where you have the largest amount of names is Jewish Palestine. Uh, you have a lot of names from the diaspora, but they are kind of uh, in small samples that are scattered all over. So you, you have uh, some names from uh, Egypt, you have some names from uh, Cyrene, you have some names from Italy, but by far the most names are um, from Palestine, so it makes sense to limit your sample to only people who are from Palestine. So everyone who shows up in Gospels and Acts or in the lexicon, but isn't uh, from Palestine gets excluded. Then he excludes family names uh, because th that's a whole uh, can of worms. He excludes names that function as nicknames. Uh, so in this case, Didymus means a twin, uh, Cephas, obviously, it's just an Aramaic for a rock. And then he excludes everyone that he thinks is fictional which uh, there's just one person in uh, Gospels and Acts actually that he thinks is fictional, and that's Lazarus, 
but only in the parable in the Gospel of Luke, because Bochum thinks that Lazarus from, of Bethany from the Gospel of John is a different person from Lazarus in Luke, and he actually existed. So, so Lazarus in John ex existed, but Lazarus in Luke didn't. Cool. I can't wait to get into some of these things <laughs> with you. I already know yeah, how yeah. you're going to be. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so that's, that's one thing, right? Uh, we found out that we can't actually, because remember that we are starting from scratch. So I got the four volumes of the lexicon that's like this thick, right? Uh, and I'm just going through the names, trying to put together like a data set that doesn't have all of these issues. What I found out is I can't actually reapply all of these criteria because Bokam doesn't say how exactly he do that, right? Like he thinks like, he says things like names that I judge often in agreement with Ilan, which is the main author of the lexicon, to be probably nicknamed, are, uh, nicknames are not included, which means he only sometimes agrees with Ilan, but not always, you know? And he doesn't say like systematically in which cases he, he agrees with her and when he doesn't. So, okay, like we, that's, that's another, let's say, issue because it prevents you from reconstructing the data exactly the same way how he did that because he doesn't document all of the different things that he did with the data. So that, that's another issue. Cool. So, but we somehow managed to put that together. Here's the list of all the people from Gospels and Acts who actually pass all of the criteria, right? So we are excluding Samaritans, excluding non-Jews, excluding everyone from the diaspora and so on. This is, I, I think, 79 different uh, name occurrences, which means some people are actually in this list twice if they had two names. So John Mark is on the list twice, one as John, and the second time as Mark. Simon Peter is here twice as well. Once as Simon and the other time as Peter. This is important because we are looking at distribution of name popularity. So someone can have two names. One of them is popular and the other one isn't. So you have to take both names into consideration. And also it's the case that in some cases, someone had multiple, or, uh, someone is reported as having multiple names, but some sources only seem to know about one name, but not another name. For example, none of the gospel authors seem to know that the high priest Caiaphas was actually named Joseph. Like th that was his actual name. Caiaphas is just a family name. But the name Caiaphas in the gospels functions the same way how his personal name would, would otherwise function. So this is something that you need to control. And the most important, maybe the most important thing about our research is that you have to realize that Bokam is saying that on his view, all of these people actually existed in history. But not everyone on, his, on this list is in contention of being invented in the first place. So the people that he's arguing against agree that a lot of these people actually existed. Their historical existence is not in question, which means when you are evaluating his work, you need to throw these people out of the sample. Right? Because both sides of that argument or of that conversation have the same position when it comes to these names. So you don't have to bother investigating them, right? You only need to focus and zero in on the names that are contested. And those are the names of people who are not externally attested, meaning they don't show up in any other source other than Gospels and Acts and later sources that are dependent on them, like early Christian authors and stuff like that. So let's start throwing people out. First, we are going to throw out everyone who is mentioned in the authentic letters of Paul, like James, John, Peter, and just so that like Jesus mythicists and other people are like, don't start screeching, we are just granting that these people existed and that their identity is what Bokam thinks it is, right? Because I don't know how uh, disputed it is, uh, for example, who John, who is mentioned in the Galatians, which John that actually is, right? Probably John, son of Zebedee, but some people would say, for all we know, it's a different person named John. We don't go into it. We just grant that these are the people that Bokam identifies. So these are externally attested, meaning they are not in contention of being invented. So we just remove them from the sample. 
Then we remove everyone who is attested in any other source, in coins, is inscriptions, and stuff like that. That's 12 names. And it just happens to be the case that they are all also mentioned by Josephus. So you don't have anyone that we would know, for example, from coins, but Josephus wouldn't mention that, which is really interesting. Uh, in most cases, these are high priests. There are three in Gospels and Acts. Uh, they are uh, members of the aristocracy, like the Herods, and so on. Um, Gamaliel, John the Baptist, uh, and that's pretty much it. And the, the two um, Jewish rebels who are mentioned in Acts, Judas the Galilean and Theudas. So those are externally attested. They are not in contention of being invented, even though some people might disagree. So we just remove them. And the last group of people that we removed are people who are mentioned in the, in the fragments of Papias of Hierapolis. And we decided to remove them because Boca makes a big deal out of Papias supposedly uh, knowing companions of Jesus's disciples. And in one of the fragments of Papias, probably from the in introduction of the, the, the Dominical Expositions that's quoted by Eusebius, he actually, Papias actually names the disciples whose companions he heard from. Okay, we grant for the sake of argument that this is true and that Papias really talked to some people who had some information that went back to the disciples of Jesus, meaning some of the information might have been independent from Gospels and Acts, right? He didn't just get his information from reading Gospels and Acts, just like everyone else, like just the martyr, uh, Irenaeus, Irenaeus claims to have some, some extra uh, biblical sources, but whatever. So we just removed everyone who is mentioned by Papias, right? That's uh, some of the apostles. Uh, Judas Iscariot is actually um, externally attested to exist if you go this route. So we just removed them, which means that if you remove all of these people who are, again, not in contention of being invented, you can see that the sample of the names that are contested actually gets pretty small, right? And this has major methodological implications because the smaller the sample size you have, the more difficult is for it, it is for you to uh, produce like statistically significant results, right? Th this is something that I hope like people understand from let's say electoral pooling, right? Like if you have a large sample, probably going to get better results. If you have good representation, that it, when you only have a small sample, there are some other issues. Like for example, some people are just completely omitted by Bokam without any explanation. Like his list of characters, named characters, Palestinian Jewish characters from the first century that uh, show up in Gospels and Acts just straight up doesn't have some of these people. He never explains why. They are probably just omitted. Just forgot about them. I don't know why, right? Tertullus is the attorney in Acts, right? Husa is a, or Hosa is um, a steward and friend of, I think, Herod Antipas. Isn't on Baukan's list for some reason. And what's what important is that if we wanted to, we could have kept deleting people from the sample because Bokam in a separate publications that he's written argues that other people from Gospels and Acts are actually sufficiently externally attested. Specifically, he argues that some members of Jesus's family and Nicodemus are attested to have existed because there are, for example, some early Christian authors like Hegesippus who mention some traditions about Jesus's family that doesn't seem to come from Gospels and Acts. And Bokam tries to establish that those traditions are like independent, so we can actually know that these people were not invented and actually existed. If we wanted to, we could have granted him this and we could have removed even more people from the sample. We decided not to, while we could have, right? So you can push this even further and you can sh keep shrinking the size of the, the sample size of the data that you have available. But we decided not to. And the second issue, and this, this is something that I mentioned in the video, is that when you are putting together a list of who is who in the New Testament, you find out that it's actually unclear. And you find out that there are actually different Christian traditions 
about personal identity of different people. So, for example, is Matthew and Levi the same person? Some Christian denominations are just going to have one saint, Matthew Levi, but then there are other Christian denominations that have Saint Matthew and Saint Levi, which if you think about it, is like mental, right? Because it's one of the characters from Gospels and Acts. So like, shouldn't you know if that's the same guy or not? If this is like divinely inspired scripture, you know, it's kind of important. And it, it actually turns out that there is a lot of uh, people like that. And it's important because whether you count like one Simon or two in particular instances, obviously it changes how many times that that name occurs in Gospels and Acts. And then it has impact on how well the name is, how, how well the popularity of that name in Gospels and Acts lines up with the total population. Uh, so this is just something that you also need to keep in mind that like all of these judgment calls are in the background of what Bogam is doing. And in at least one case, it seems to be the case that the way how he's treating the data becomes circular. Because if you know your uh, Gospels and Acts really well, you will know that in Act 6, there is the scene where um, six, seven deacons are elected in the early church, right? And uh, Acts even gives their name. And Wokam throws all of those people out of the data set. He doesn't say why, he just says he thinks that they were all born in the diaspora. But the text itself doesn't say that, and there isn't any indication that this is true. So I don't know where like Bokam got this from. And it, it's even worse because one of them, Nikolaos, is explicitly said to be from Antioch, which means that like at face value, all of the rest of them are just from Palestine, which is where the scene takes place, right? And what's very important is that all of them have a Greek name. And if this is the reason why Bokam decided to exclude them, it's circular. Because one of the indicators of how well the distribution of name popularity lines up with the Palestinian Jewish population is the percentage of uh, named characters with a Greek name, right? So he's kind of like, I don't want to say he's manipulating the data to get a better result, but if you actually take those, these names and you put them back into the sample, except for Nikolaos, who shouldn't be there, you find out that characters in, with a Greek name are statistically significantly overrepresented in Gospels and Acts compared to the Palestinian Jewish population. So you actually get an outlier. But you only get that if you exclude all of these people, which is something that Bokam doesn't justify. So that's like a red flag, you know? Um, yeah. Any questions? I, I would like to mention, I, I don't have the exact example of which synagogue, but when I traveled over in Israel, we were in several synagogues in the Galilee. And then we, as we went closer to Jerusalem, there were some synagogues right there uh, outside of Jerusalem, like right where we were at. And on the floor, there were, there was Hebrew and Greek uh, inscriptions. And a lot of the names were Greek. I can't remember if they were all God fearers or if this was a combination of Jews with Greek names and, you know, Greeks or non, non Jews that helped fund building the, the synagogue, et cetera. But it would be impressive to find that because I've seen in previous interviews with others who kind of fall into that Bauckham category of wanting everything to be historical, the undesigned coincidence crowd and stuff. They like to dichotomize, like really split hairs on, Jews in Jerusalem would never be as Hellenized as you guys try to make them out to be. And I'm saying wrong. Like, I'm not saying no. that they weren't maybe heightened in their religious sense because they're closer to the heart of their temple, et cetera. But I'm saying, I think that that's just, there's so much problem in assuming that they're so dichotomized and anti-Hellenist. And so the, that would mean Jews would be carrying the name, as you mentioned in the Apologia video, even some were named Zeus. I mean, <laughs> you can't get any more Hellenized than that. So, anyway. Well, actually, actually, so uh, when it comes to when it comes to so um, there is a lot in the lexicon. There is a lot of people who are identifiable as Jewish who have a pagan Theophric names, uh, which means it's a name that has a component that's like a personal name of a Greek god, like Zeus, right? 
so Diogenes, for example, which means born of Zeus, is a name that's attested. When it comes to names that, where the uh, divine name is specifically Zeus, the, the, the case for Hellenization is a little bit weaker because you could say that that was just a, their way how to transliterate or like transcribe Yahweh into Greek language, right? So when a Jew in uh, first century Palestine was talking about Zeus, it's possible that he kind of like syncretized or what he meant by that was, was Yahweh. Right. I agree. It's just yeah. in the Greek cultural world, the the top deity is Zeus. So when you get, if you are given the name uh, Diogenes or Diogenes, it doesn't necessarily mean that your family is like worshiping the pagan gods. It could just mean that that's a like a theophoric name that where the divine element is like a Greek uh, Greek uh, parallel to to Yahweh. A much right. better case are names like Apollodorus, gift from Apollo. If you are an, a Palestinian Jew who is named Apollodoros, something went wrong in the family, right? Because Apollon, best case scenario doesn't exist. Worst case scenario, scenario is like a demon, right? In the Jewish thought, right? But those kinds of names are attested. They are not like super common, but they are attested, like many of them. Even in, in, in Gospels Acts, you have Apollos, the Jewish Christian Right, who was who only knew uh, John's baptism, so his name is derived from Apollon, and you have uh, Enneas, who shows up in Acts as well. Right, it's one of the the persons that 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 Paul healed, and we all know who Enneas was. Right, like wh what's the wh who's the one person that's named Enneas in the uh, ancient world? What's the 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 um, uh, the ancestor of the Romans? Right, right. who escaped yes. Troy. So there you go, right? And, and, people would obviously know that. I was going to say Brian must be from the people's front of Judea or the, the Judean <laughs> front of the people. And Paul, we know he had to be an apostle. There's no doubt about that. So, um, Well, I learned this week that, uh, you know, Apollos has nothing to do with apologia. So <laughs> I was going to maybe steer my channel if, if ever Apollos worship ever became big. I was going to steer my <laughs> nice. channel that way, but apparently it's not. <laughs> Doesn't yeah. work. One of the things that I notice in this whole process, though, is um, whenever I've tried, to, whenever I've you know published a paper like in a technical field, one of the most important things is to be able to show exactly how you go from the raw data to what you actually use and what are all the steps. That's why it's common to post like whatever your computer code is if you're doing a statistical analysis of something that goes so because you often will have to filter the data because you're looking at a certain problem, blah, blah, blah. And so um, and so it's really critical to kind of lay out, especially so that someone could reproduce exactly what you're doing. And and it seems like there has been no effort to do that at all. And and that to me, I mean, I've seen that, but it's, it's, it's really uh, uh, unfortunate when it happens because it, it really isn't something that that one should, um, you know, you find in, in in a proper academic, you know, paper. Yeah. So so after you make all of the judgment calls and you do all of the data filtering and stuff like that, this is the sample that you get. So these are the contested characters, and it shows you how many, like, how popular the name is in Gospels and Acts. So how many contested <coughs> characters with that name there are. So we can see that the most popular name is, for example, Simon, and there are eight Simons. And immediately what becomes apparent is that, so uh, uh, by the way, like the, the labels are taken from the lexicon. So uh, there are different ways how to uh, anglicize or transcribe the names, but the lexicon just aggregates that so that all of the different variants of the same name are uh, just like together, right? So Ptolemy, for example, the one Ptolemy that shows up in the contested sample is Bartholomew, which is like a, a an anglicized version of a son of Ptolemy, which Balkam just uh, puts together with, with other uh, people who are named Ptolemaios or something like that. And Eleazar, for example, is Lazarus. That's the same name, right? Jacob is, is James. Uh, Judah is uh, can be Joseph. Uh, no, sorry. Judah can be Jude or Judas, Joseph, Joseph, that's the, a variant of the same name. Uh, Simon, Simeon, uh, another, another instance. And what you can see right away from this is that... You, it, you muted again. Something happened again. It's Satan in the name of Jesus. 
That's how we know that what we're doing is against God because God is messing with Camille sound. This is what's happening. Gosh. Cool. Can you hit me now? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that was Paul's so, powers that time, though, not mine. Cool. So, 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 so something that you happen that you see right away is that almost the entire data set actually consists of people who are uh, only consist of names that only have one user in Gospels and Acts, right? So there's only a handful of names that show up more than once. And what's very important is that all of those names are also among the most popular names in Palestine, which goes a long way towards explaining how you would get a distribution of name popularity like that. But before we go into it, uh, we need to talk about a very important component of the chapter, which is the fact that Boca makes a big deal out of the fact that apparently popularity of personal name in Palestine was very different than in the diaspora. And what he wants to argue is that, look, skeptics say, or like forum critics say, that the Gospels were written in the diaspora. Uh, so like Mark was written in Italy or something, Matthew was written in Alexandria or Syria or something like that. And it's just the case that Jew, even Jews living in Italy or in Syria, name popularity was very different in the region. And it was apparently very difficult for people to pick appropriately Palestinian Jewish names. So if a lot of characters were invented in the diaspora, the distribution of name popularity wouldn't line up so well. It would be out of whack. It would be more similar to the distribution of name popularity that you get in the diaspora. But, and this is probably the most like hilarious aspect of the chapter, his entire uh, evidential support for that idea is 45 names. All of them from, are from Egypt. Based on that, he says that if invention of names took place in the diaspora, the appropriate names simply could not have been chosen and the distribution of names would be impossible to explain. Right. Okay, <laughs> like that's a lot. I actually hunted even the source behind this data and I discovered, and this is something that Bokam doesn't say, that out of those 45 names, 11 names are from the same town, from Leontopolis, which is where like a, a, a competitor to the second Jerusalem temple was built. Right? I, I think it's a part of Alexandria. You're talking about in Egypt, uh, we would call it what, Her yeah. Heriopolis, something like that, I guess? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but but the, the, the point is that like, okay, if, if you have a sample of 45 names and 11 of them are from just from one location, all right, like... <laughs> I don't know, Brian, do you want to say something about that? Because I, I would have to be like, I would probably have <laughs> regret what that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really, I mean, it's just, the number is so small that, and, and it's clear, you know, sometimes the data that you get is not ideal. It's, it's what you have and you have to make the best out of it. But, um, but that's, you just need to tone down your, your conclusions. And you can't say that, you know, if I happen to get a data set that comes from like, you know, say possibly two, maybe three small locations, you know, a quarter of the data comes from one town that I'm going to make a, a real, uh, a, uh, a strong claim about Jews basically everywhere outside of Palestine, right? It, it just, it's just, you just can't support that kind of claim with that few, few data points. Yeah. Well yeah. said. Like, j just think about that. Like, if there was one family, just one family, that for some like idiosyncratic reason really liked the name Dositeus, for example, which is one of the names that's popular among these 45 names. And it just happens to be the family where the, the ossuary we happened to found, like, randomly. That would throw this data out of whack, right? In like pretty significant way, because it's just 45 people. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, this is not good. And of course, uh, so that's one problem, the sample size is small, but of course the assumption that if invention of names took place in Palestine, the people making the invention, which would be either people who are telling the stories or it would be the gospel authors themselves, just wouldn't be able to pick appropriately Palestinian Jewish names. Like that assumption, Bokam doesn't 
justify it. He just presupposes that this is the case, or he just asserts it, right? So what we did in the article is we kind of suggested some what we call channels of exposure of how uh, Christians in the diaspora would plausibly know that some Palestinian Jewish names are more popular than others. And so they would be more likely to use those names for any characters that were invented. And we have this nice table in the uh, article and the columns A, B, C, D, and E are the different channels of exposure, basically. And what you see is that they tend to accumulate around the most popular names. And these are exactly the only names that show up multiple times in the Gospels and Acts. So these channels of exposure, plausibly being the case, I think, go some way towards explaining the distribution of name popularity that we see in Gospels and Acts, right? So what are these? First thing, uh, that's column number A, is it's really, really interesting that when it comes to how uh, males, which is the sample that we are working with in the article, uh, because there is just like not enough female names at all, right? Like there the uh, issues with sample sizes are just much, much worse. So we just said, okay, we're not even going to bother with, with, with female names because everything that we says about the small sample size is just like multiple times worse. So when it comes to male names, it's actually really interesting that by the first century, an overwhelmingly large percentage of male Jews were given the names of Maccabean leaders. So Eleazar and then his sons, so Simon, Joseph, uh, and so on. And this, this was apparently a way how to uh, show support for the Maccabean political project, essentially, right? Against the Hellenization and, and stuff like that. Uh, about 38% uh, of all male names in the lexicon that are from first century Palestine are Maccabean names, which is a lot. Like when you have a population, you won't probably find that strong accumulation of only a handful of names being this popular, right? Like if you picked, uh, I don't know, contemporary American population, the top, I think it's seven names, wouldn't uh, account for nearly uh, this much. If you took uh, ancient Greek, uh, actually, population, which is, we, we have a prosopography for that as well. We have a list of named, uh, known named people for that as well. The, even the most popular names don't account for nearly this large uh, a percentage of the population. Uh, with Roman names, it could be different because for some reasons, Romans just kept recycling the same like 10 names. Uh, everyone was named like decimals or something like that, right? But this is definitely unusual. Now, what we argue is that given that it was apparently stereotypical for a Palestinian Jew to have a Maccabean name, it's not super implausible that even people in the diaspora would know that this is how Jews specifically from Palestine were very often named, right? Like the fact that this is so frequent kind of motivates you into thinking that, yeah, maybe someone in the first century like know that Jews specifically for, from Palestine are, are often named Simon because Simon was one of the, the, the major Maccabean brothers, right? Oh, that's one channel of exposure. Uh, the, the second channel of exposure are, of course, the, is of course the fact that um, it's established that even before the Gospels were written, uh, Christians in the diaspora were exchanging letters and even visiting Jewish Christians who were specifically from Palestine. So, for example, we know that from the Pauline epistles that Paul mentions people like Peter, James, John. So those are some of the, that's again like a different uh, channel of exposure. So people were sending correspondence and they were uh, visiting each other. So that's another way how they would have known some Palestinian Jewish names. And then C and D, and E uh, as well actually, it's just the fact that, of course, the gospel authors might have some indication about certain Palestinian Jewish names being more popular than others because they had sources. And probably the most important source are prior gospels, right? So the author of the Gospel of Matthew, for example, just takes most of the names that he mentions, I think all of them except one or two, from the Gospel of Mark, right? So the reason why the, the, the author of the Gospel of Matthew sort of gets it right is the author of the Gospel of Mark, 
who gets it right as well. And it's actually interesting that if you look at the first gospel, the gospel of Mark, the most popular names in Palestine are already very popular in the gospel of Mark. But if you actually look at where exactly they are located in the text, you find out that for uh, a lot of these uh, really popular names, they cluster in two lists of names. You have the names of the 12, of 12 apostles and you have the list of Jesus's brothers. It could be the case that either of these two lists is authentic actually, either completely or at least partially. Which means that if I'm an author of the Gospel of Mark and I want to invent an episode of Jesus healing someone or meeting someone, having conversation, conversation someone or something like that, and I need a name, I might want to lift a name from the list of either the 12 apostles or the list of Jesus's brothers, because that's something that I have available, right? And if that tendency exists, it would explain why specifically names that show up in these lists have a tendency to be more popular in the total data set, right? So it's just like explaining that there might have been sources that helped the gospel authors to select appropriately Palestinian Jewish names. And one thing that's really important is that there is a big difference in terms of how many named characters each gospel author has. And this is shown here. This is kind of busy. It's called a Senke diagram, but it's actually really interesting if you kind of wrap your head around it, right? So um, can you see my, uh, you don't see my mouse, right? Uh, how do I do that? Uh, I don't. Oh, there you okay, go. Cool. There you go. There you go. So, so this, these are all the names in the Gospel of Mark, named characters in the Gospel of Mark. So you have 22. And this shows what happens to them. So a portion of them disappear. So they are only named in Mark, and they, they, they disappear. Uh, the, here would be, for example, Alexander and Rufus, the uh, sons of Simon of Cyrene. They are not mentioned in any other gospel. But most of them are also mentioned in Matthew. And some of them are mentioned in Luke Acts, but not in Matthew, right? 17 named characters are in Matthew. These are the contested names, by the way. So 17 contested names are in Matthew. Where do they come from? Most of them come from the Gospel of Mark, but some of them are added, which means they are in Matthew, but they are not in Mark. But look what happens when you move to, gospel, to Luke Acts. Right? Luke Acts has a huge number of named characters. Most of them come from Matthew, and out of those, most of them come from Mark. Some of them come directly from Mark, but then there is a huge number of people that are get added that sh don't show up anywhere else. And this kind of makes sense because, especially in Acts, there is a lot of new people because the events take place later. So those are events that take place after Jesus' uh, death, uh, in some cases like years after Jesus' death, right? Because new Jewish characters keep showing up even towards the end of Acts when Paul is being investigated and stuff like that. Most of them disappear, meaning they are not mentioned anywhere else. Some of them are also mentioned in John, and then you have some addition of characters in John, like uh, Nicodemus, Nathaniel, and so on. So when you, but the point is that the author of Luke Acts is actually hugely important when it comes to explaining this data set. Because if you ask the question, why is it the case that the name popularity in Gospels and Acts in, in the total data set lines up with the popularity in the contemporary population. It's the author of Luke Acts who is to a large degree responsible for this. It's not the author of Matthew because he just grabs names from Mark, right? It's not the author of John because like most of the names he gets from someone else and he adds only a few. It's the author of Luke Acts. So what if he used Josephus? That would explain it, right? <laughs> because the works of Josephus, including the antiquity, they have a large number, of course, of named first century Palestinian Jews. And even scholars who don't think that the Gospels are based on eyewitness testimony, and even scholars who don't think that the author of Luke Acts used Josephus, still recognize that out of all of these four guys, this guy knows something about first century Palestine. Even if he wasn't a traveling companion of Paul, he knows 
some names of some rulers. He knows Quirinius, for example. He gets it wrong, but he knows about him. He knows that Herod the Great. Uh, he knows that Herod wasn't uh, Basilos, uh, it, that he wasn't a king, right? He correct, corrects some of the titles. Uh, he knows some of the rebel leaders, whether he got that from Josephus or from somewhere else. So he is a really good candidate for having at least some information about some names of Palestinian Jews being more popular than others. And he's simultaneously the guy who is overwhelmingly responsible for the structure of the data set. So this kind of correspondence or this alignment of him being the guy who is better informed and him also being the guy who accounts for a large uh, percentage of the data set goes a long way to explaining why the correspondence exists. And the, the final reason, and that then we can maybe stop for, for some questions, is uh, that's, that's uh, E. Actually, actually, let me keep that. This is what we call McDonald's doublets. So we, of course, cite uh, Dennis McDonald uh, because he's amazing. And what specifically what he proposes is that in the Gospel of Mark, some of the named characters kind of form pairs around, uh, and the, the, so the, the, there are basically pairs of characters that have the same personal name, and those pairs form reversal of expectation patterns, which are otherwise very often in the Gospel of Mark. A typical example is Simon Peter and Simon of Cyrene. So you would expect that Simon Peter, given that he is Jesus' uh, closest disciple, he is the one that shows up most often as the character in the narrative, would be the one who would be by Jesus' side towards the very end. But reversal of expectations happens. It's exactly Simon Peter who ends up denying Jesus. And Jesus' cross is then carried by Simon of Cyrene, who is a completely unknown character who shows up out of nowhere, right? Uh, and McDonald actually suggests that this isn't a coincidence because history, actual history, doesn't uh, kind of unwind in nice uh, doublets and reversals of expectations. He suggests that at least some of the people in those doublets were invented in order to facilitate this reversal of expectation patterns. And it, it's interesting that if you actually look at who those people are, it's also Mary, but we are only looking at males. It's again, the same names. And as you can see, all of these considerations cluster around the same names. So any combination of these helps explain why we observe the pattern in the data that we do. Because you have to remember, these are the only names that show up more than once. And these are the most popular names, both in Gospels and Acts and in the contemporary population. So this is where uh, Brian's part, I think, starts. So, um, if any questions? Brian, I was going to say real quick before Brian gets deep into <laughs> no, the numbers, because this is good. <laughs> and I love how well, well spoken. And, and when you explain, Brian, you're really clear. And I love that yeah. about you. Thanks. Um, yeah. one interesting thing, and you didn't get into the example, but you did mention, you know, all these names work there, Camille, is that Joseph, I mean, you have Joseph, the father of Jesus, who in, you know, the culture would have buried his son. He's yeah. not the one who buries him. And I love that about McDonald's yeah. point is he's saying Joseph of Arimathea, the same name person as his father, mm -hmm. ends up burying Jesus. Right. Again, playing that narrative reversal, right. kind of like it, the highs and lows, the way they structured this, it signals to me that we're dealing with more literary than yeah. literal. And yeah. that I, I don't know how to, to yeah. I wish I could press a button and just give that to our apologetic friends <laughs> and have them see this. But my recent interview with Hugo Mendes on, on the Gospel of John, you know, he was talking about it. He's writing a book, co-authoring it with Bart Ehrman. And he said, I, I don't want to be rude, but most people who are writing on John, I feel don't don't know how to read well. This is more more literary. It, it's not history. <clears throat> And if you're not seeing that, I can't, I don't know how to help. I don't know how to get people to like think in this yeah. way. So thank you for yeah. also vindicating um, Dennis in light of the fact that he, he is a juggernaut. This guy's a maverick. And he's also been kind of in a way not valued the way I think he should, because I understand some of his stuff's contentious and, but I, I I'm thankful that you did this. That's all my words. So. Yeah. 
I also want to comment that that even Balcom himself admits that a name like Simon might have been chosen for other reasons like being you know a Maccabean name or, or something like that 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 there might be for some of the super popular ones there might have been some external reason for for for, for choosing it so even Balcom he doesn't come out and quite say that but but it's 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 very close and and uh, but he doesn't ever talk about how that might undermine his case significantly if if some of those yeah. more popular names are really you know yeah well i mean that's that's maybe important to mention so he he kind of uh, makes a difference between what would happen if uh, some characters were invented inside palestine but like by people who are in palestine and what would happen if they were invented in the diaspora and th he thinks that Okay, if they were invented in Palestine, then maybe the people making the, like doing the inventing would know these most popular names, right? So he grants that. He, he doesn't think they would know it if the invention took place in the diaspora. And our point is basically to show that, no, actually, there are reasons to believe that even people in the diaspora would have at least some like weak tendency to be more likely to pick uh, Simon as a name for invented character than let's say Harkak or Ipsalos or something like that, which are like rare uh, names that are still attested uh, in first century Palestine. One comment so on shall like we do real... statistical? Yeah, yeah, I just want to make one comment. When I was in Kuwait, this is not a perfect correlation, but when I was in, uh, in Kuwait, I did contract work for a year in Afghanistan and I was passing through Kuwait and I was getting a mill. Um, just average Joe on the street in Kuwait, I mean, like, most of the people there don't speak English, but they they try to know a little bit. And I go to order and they go, New York, uh, New York. And I'm like, yeah, I'm from the United States. And they're like, New York. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I just accept it. But the point is, is like, they know New York. If I said North Carolina, they'd be like, New York, right? Like, in a, like they don't know that North Carolina is not that popular, but New York, everybody knows that equates America. It's a bad correlation, but the point is, is like the the popularity, even for people who probably never even know a thing about America that much, they at least know New York and can tie it in. Now imagine people who are Jews. They have a heritage communal connection in some way. They're communicating, even if they have differences in their approaches. So to assume that they don't know these popular names is kind of, that's I just don't think that's plausible. Yeah, yeah. I, I think like, okay, I, I'm not sure if Bokam would make this argument, but like it would definitely be relevant for some Christian apologists, right? So there might be a tension if you want to say that simultaneously, I don't know, if someone in Paul's Corinthian church wanted to fact check him on the 500 people who saw the risen Jesus, like it would be plausible for them to travel to Palestine and like find those people or talk, talk to them. But also saying that people in the diaspora wouldn't know that Simon is more popular than again, like some obscure Palestinian Jewish name like Heracleitos or something like that, you know? Right. Um, can't have it both ways, right? That's like super either good point. I love that. those were, yeah, either those were completely separate, isolated communities. It's the same thing that comes up when people are uh, thinking about the attestation to gospel authorship, right? They say, oh, all of these different authors who are writing in different areas of the Mediterranean give the same names. Yeah, which they were all in Rome at some point, right? Like they were either from the Roman Church or they corresponded with someone in Rome, or they actually personally visited Rome, like right? Tertullian, uh, Cyprian, um, these kinds of guys, right? So if you think that these, uh, that these communities were like networking and that they were connected, especially if you think that they were not very large, which I don't know, like by the late first century was probably the case, then it's not difficult to explain this uh, exchange of information, you know? So if, if someone came up with the names in Rome in like 160 or something like that. It's not surprising that in the like eighth century or sixth century or something like that, the same name shows up in uh, Syriac uh, manuscripts. That's something you cut from the video that we did when I was commenting like Testify's challenge was, well, what if you had to do a story set in Germany a hundred years ago? And I had relatives who lived in Germany a hundred years ago, but I've never been there. 
But if I was supposed to do that, well, all I would do was, well, let me think of all the stories of my grandpa's friends. Like, because my grandpa <laughs> told me lots of stories about his friends, and those are the names. It would be easy to yeah. pick. Like, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, not hard. And we're yeah. not even talking I, 100 years anymore. We're talking like 50 or 40. So, right. Well, I think what, one thing that's very important to keep in mind, though, I want people to avoid thinking about this in terms of examples from like, either contemporary examples or examples from recent history. Like, I don't want people to evaluate it. I don't want people evaluating whether what we are saying, like, makes sense or is convincing based on what people know about name popularity today or something like that. And this is sure. like a general problem, That's right? Like, Which is why I kind when of... We, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we were talking about it before, right? So th this is something that happens, and it's like a general problem. Uh, it should be uh, it should be like a fallacy name, like a fallacy of contemporary examples or something like that. So people are presented with some argument or some consideration about what was going on two thousand years ago. They construct an anal an analogy which involves people who are alive today in the US, in Europe, or something like that. then and that that's like an intuition bump, right? So it they form an opinion based on that contemporary example and then they project the conclusions back to antiquity and it almost never works because the background information is different so things that are plausibly the case today the conclusions about them are not going to necessarily apply to antiquity even if the analogy is pretty close right and my worry is that if the article kind of uh, starts conversations uh, maybe in the apologetics community or in like evangelical christian community or something like that it's going to devolve into people thinking about what's plausible about knowledge of personal names and name popularity today in the us or in europe or in germany like 50 years ago or something like that and people are then going to project those conclusions back to, to antiquity, right? Like it's super tempting to do because most lay people don't have background information about what's plausible 2000 years ago, but don't, don't do that, right? It's not helpful. Um, yeah, and that, that happens from time to time. All right, is it let's, Brian's let's, turn? Let's do statistical analysis. Yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, I think well, it'd be easier if, maybe if I shared my screen and that way I control all right. it. Yeah, actually, right? actually, uh, actually, I think uh, uh, the, I want. I might want to go through this really quickly myself yeah. because those are still my slides, right? Yeah, but I, I, I time-wise, I we're going to skip to to slide fifty-three, so I'm going to control it. <laughs> All right, cool, cool, cool. Are you sharing? So, uh, Camille is. No, I'm not. And so he has okay, to close well, out, okay, I think, and then and then um, I can go to my share screen. Um, yeah, whatever share screen, and. Uh, um, it's somewhat while you're doing that, someone asked me, you know, where can we find the doublets by McDonald? I did put the link up for the Homeric Epics and the Gospel of Mark. You said another one of his sources, and I can't remember which one that was. And then yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, we cite it in the in the article, so you'll just have to get the article. And and just so you know, I'm fairly confident his synopses of epic tragedy in the gospel covers a like all, I guarantee you he goes into some of the stuff for sure in that because he made sure it was like his life's work all in one book. And it's really affordable. $20, $30 book. It's got endless examples. So, All right. Brian, are you there? I wonder if it like bogged him down. <laughs> Camille's here. Yeah, I think it's uh, he froze. He froze. That's Someone... unfortunate. Yeah, it is. Uh oh. Uh oh. So worst case scenario, if if it if for some reason his computer isn't handling it, are you able to share it for him? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. So, <laughs> Brian, what happened there, there, man? Yeah, so I went to I, I went to do the share screen, and it decided okay, it's not going to let me do it because it's 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 just a uh, it's, it's setting me into a a, a loop okay. of, uh, of of security stuff. So it'll probably kick me out again if I try. Uh, Kimmel, can you share yours again, and then we'll just jump to I'll absolutely. just tell you when it's jump screen. 
Absolutely. Cool uh, deal. Okay, I need to get the slides again. Uh, I'll have to make sure next go. time to, to debug some of these things ahead of time, but that's all right. <laughs> Can you see it? Oh, yep, I see it. All right. There we go. Okay, jump to slide 53, please. 53, all right. Yep. Do, 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 do. There Ooh. we go. Okay, yeah. So, um, so when, when so Camille approached me about doing the kind of statistical analysis for this, and, and obviously the first part was was dealing with the data, and he talked a lot about it. And I just wanted to get a sense for the scale of it. So the uh, entire database list is is, is somewhere around 15,000 names, and then it gets cooled down to about 2,000 valid names, of which like around 400 are unique, and only about 80 show up in the gospel. So you can see immediately that with the entire data set, we, we bring it down to a rather rather small, but not impossibly small list. And 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 we'll come back to that uh, another time. The other, the next step that we did, so next slide on 54, is there were there are kind of standard methods for dealing with these sorts of problems when you're comparing distributions of of things, and so. I started with like the first things I thought of, and these would be the things that, if someone hasn't looked at this 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 project before, they they'd be like, oh yeah, you know, did you try this test? Did you try that test? And these are the ones that would come up. So uh, and so there's something called the cumulative distribution, which essentially just says like if you just you know rank order all of the all of the things you're talking about, and what is the cumulative distribution? It starts off at zero, goes to 100, percent and and you um and, and you can you can often do a comparison and. Um, the problem with this, and it turned out, um, and, and I never see examples of this in, in stats textbooks, is that the, the data set we're dealing with here doesn't have a natural order. So like, if you have something like um, a, a population's height, the heights of the people, or how much they weigh, there's a natural order from light to heavy, from small to large, right? So, so, so there's a, a natural order no matter what data set you're talking about. But when you're talking about names, there's no natural order. You could you, you could rank them possibly by popularity, but each sublist, the popularity of Josephus versus the entire data set versus uh, uh, the Gospels is going to be different. And if you change the order, you change the cumulative distribution. And any test that that's based off of the cumulative distribution breaks. So it just it'll and and so I you know chase my tail for a little while. Uh, looking at all these various tests and say, oh, maybe this one will work, maybe this one will work, and and uh, so we didn't, you know, um, you know weren't able to, to do it. But but I, I want to put that out there, saying like these are the things that we that we did and why we landed on the, the method, methods that, that we do. Many of the the standard methods will not work on this on, on this data set, and um, and some of the standard methods, even if they did work, don't deal with the uncertainties in the source. Uh, uh, distribution. Uh, they only deal with possibly the, the uncertainties in the text that you're trying to, uh, uh, the subset that you're trying to compare to. And so you can actually get misleading results in, in that case. So uh, essentially, what did we do? So that's the next slide. Yeah. So we imagine um, that we have kind of large dice, and each, each face of the die is going to be labeled with a name. And the area of the of the name is going to scale with how um, uh, popular that name is. So essentially, the side that uh, has Simon will will be larger than the, the the side side that has some other rare name. Okay, so we just imagine we have this this die, and this die would have about four hundred you know, over 400 uh, uh, different sides um, because there's over 400 different names. And then what we can do is we can say, okay, the gospels have about 80 names. So we're gonna simulate a gospel text by simply rolling this die that has the names, writing out which ones come up, and then and how often Simon comes up and Joseph and James and et cetera. Um, and, and we roll it 80 times and we kind of look, okay, in, in, if, if we had a text with 80 names, that was drawn from the source material. How often, you know? Then we can just do this, like you know, five hundred thousand times, or a very large number of times. How often does Simon actually come up? How often does James actually come up? And so we can com compare that. Um, and it's even more than that, where the um, even if we are kind of imagining this this die, that we actually construct a whole bunch of different di dice that that um, are that have that are varied based on the uncertainty in our source material. So, so if we take the kind of the full corpus that we're talking about and we say, let's say there are uh, um, uh, 70 names out, um, out of um, say um, 
or let's say let's say there's like 100 names out of a thousand so you have 10 percent right um it could be 10%, it could be 9.5%, it could be 10.5%. There's some uncertainty in that simply because we're estimating that fraction from a finite quantity, 100 over 1,000. The larger that sample is, the smaller that uncertainty is. So we have uncertainty in the estimate of even the fraction of the name in the general population. And then we want to also you know, simulate the uncertainty of taking subsets of that of like 80 names or whatever it is. So that's how that that's kind of how we you know are imagining it. So I want to pause for right there for you know any any, any questions. We're going to walk through some of the math, not 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 with equations, but mostly with pictures and tables. But uh, uh, but I wanted to pause there if there's a question uh, that you, that you might have. I know Camille knows this. Um, Paul, did you have anything before we move forward? No, I you know I was just excited about. Uh... <laughs> imagining the prospect of this dice <laughs> because, <laughs> um it's my I, one thing I, another thing i learned this week was a d120 seems to be the uh the most sides of, that you can that exist on a physical dice which i think is what's uh, displayed on the screen there so yep. anyway the physics <laughs> part of it me i i all i i went on tangents when i was making this video so that was a fun thing <laughs> cool yep so uh next slide which we'll pause very shortly. This is a slide to scare everyone away, right? Um, so <laughs> I'm not going to go through it, but this is the, the, the point. You, could, like, you, you know, can't the, argue with numbers. Yeah, exactly. This this is, is, you know, don't don't yeah. even try it. This, this <laughs> validates the atheist worldview. Bingo, right. And gotcha. that's the end of the discussion. <laughs> yep. So, you know, it's, it's been great, guys. That's <laughs> Have a nice one. <laughs> yeah. So I put this here to show that that there's actually some some uh, you know reasonably serious math. There's actually a, a link to a, a tutorial on some on some of this for 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 other systems. Uh, but but this uh, it actually has some theoretical justification for it. But but I, I prefer pictures. So we want to go to the next slide. So this is uh, an example. This is from the, the the large source material, and this is um, essentially the fraction of each die taken up by the various names. So Simon is about 7%, but there's some uncertainty. As you can see, there's a width to it. So some of the dice that I might make for the general population have uh, a Simon at about 8%. So actually it's over to the right-hand side. So way over on the dark blue one on the right-hand side, right? And then if you go one to the left, that's an orange curve, that's Joseph, right? So that's a little bit less. And then as you get less and less popular, uh, um, you get, you, you, you have both the kind of like the, the most common fraction, but also the uncertainty. So this is, this is from the source material. And Bauckham never does anything like this. He just, he literally just looks at the, the, the peak fraction and that's it. But, but given the, the sample size, of you know about 400 some odd names there is some uncertainty in how many simons actually were in the population that he's actually that, 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 he's, that he's actually looking at and so we want to make sure that, that that uncertainty is 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 taken care of so if you go to the next slide so this is kind of an example of of, of generating dice so we make a table like this each row here uh, uh, is one is one die and it gives the you know fraction of the names uh, for each one. So the first die, the zeroth die, there is has about seven point two percent Simons and six point six percent Josephs, and then the next one is just another one. And, and you can see that the Simons kind of are around seven percent, but some are a little higher and some are a little lower because of the variation in the in the uh, 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 the full the, the full data set. And so we essentially generate many, many of these die as we do it. We actually do like about 100,000. Uh, um, and then from that, we roll out uh, a, a single, uh, like a single text, like an 80 uh, person text. So if you go to the next slide. So from each die, we actually roll out uh, um, like 78 times, so that's, it's close to 80. Uh, each row is one simulated text. So one of the texts had seven Simons, five Josephs, two Eleazars, and so on. The, the next one had seven Simons, nine Josephs, and five Eleazars, right? Because there's some uncertainty, both because of the uh, randomness of the process of having a small, like, you know, 80, 80 word text. And also we are drawing fractions from a, you know, small ish, you know, 400 uh, uh, name. Uh, so that's pretty much what we do. We do this like 500,000 times. And then we, and, and then we can just count up how often does, you know, Simon come up and, and does it, how much, how often does it come up one time and two times and three times. And in a typical fashion, what we like to do is say, 
okay, 95% of the time it falls within like a certain range. And that's the range that we can kind of confidently, you know, know what, what, what they are. So that's what this, this next one is. So the black triangles kind of show that, that 95% range of what we would expect to see if, uh, you know, drawn from the source, from, from the source material. And, and pretty much, you know, so, I mean, one could look at this and be like, oh, you know what, this actually fits pretty well because the orange dots, which is what we actually have in the gospels and acts, uh, fit within that range. Uh, uh, and so you could say, well, this fits, this fits pretty well, which it does. You know, there's a few outliers, Jacob. Except, except for Jacob. Outlier. Yeah, there's, yeah, easily, yeah. there's a bit more uh, of that. These, then, are, these are outliers, basically. Uh, some of yeah. them are not shown because mm. that would get too crowded. The, yeah, the table goes uh, on for quite a long time. And, yeah, and so yeah. I'm only showing them yeah, the, yeah. the first part of it. Um, so, and, and so, and, and so when you look at that, and, and Balcom himself would say, this is, you know, this shows really great agreement. The problem is that if you, if you said, okay, you know what, I'm just going to choose names out of a hat completely. On average, basically, you just get one, you know, one of each kind of name, right? You know, so so that's it would it would just be like at the bottom. And if you notice that the that the range drawn from the source material pretty much overlaps, like if you had one of each name, you would still be completely consistent with it with 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 that with that thing. So 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 essentially, you know, we can say that that nearly any way of generating the names would pretty much given that we are dealing with only like 80 names or so uh would pretty much fall right within the the um uh, these ranges just because they're, they're they're so huge one might be able to make the, the the claim that maybe simon uh uh because because the lower bound is at one but still that's that it's, that's extremely weak uh, um and so that's you know, that's kind of the main thing now it doesn't have to be this way Okay, so if you go to the next slide, this shows the same thing for Josephus, right? So for Josephus, you can see that again, it seems to fit reasonably well in the in the range. The green dots are within the black and and, and the, the two black triangles on the on the on the different ranges along the way. Um, you could have had you know far fewer Simons, and it would have fallen out of that of, out of that range. Um, and if you just drew things from a hat, then clearly the first like top eight names or so would not fall in that in that area and so what so what we're seeing here is like you know that if we if if the data set were, were larger it is potentially a one would potentially able to be able to, to distinguish between um the, the the different types of uh whether whether it kind of fits with the, the source material or it doesn't and uh, uh so it's just the fact that pretty much you have a small uh, uh small data set that you know, it's consistent with nearly with nearly anything, and that I think is a uh, um, uh, um, is a um, is a is a problem. Um, there may yeah, be I think, yeah yeah. You, you wanted uh, to also show what happens when you change the prior. Right? Yeah, yeah. So one of the things about um, these sorts of analysis is is that there's there's a kind of a prior probability that you have to put on each of the each of the names. You know, like for for instance, if 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 a, if a name doesn't show up in the Gospels, it doesn't mean that there's a zero percent chance that this name uh, um, would not. Uh, uh, could not have appeared in the Gospels, right? So it just it just happened that it was that that it, that it wasn't in there. A uh, typical way to do this in kind of text analysis, if you if you uh, um, look at the systems that say filter email for spam and not spam, uh, they there's generally a prior set on on what counts as, as as spam and what what counts as not spam, and you can do the same thing here. And the effect is that that uh, in the original analysis that that you uh, effectively just add, you know, pretend as if every name at least occurs at least once so you don't get zeros coming coming in um now that's a that's a very common prior for for the kind of you know, text analysis that you might see uh but it, it's not the only one and and one another one that's also somewhat common uh, is what's called the Jeffries prior, and that has uh, you know I'm not going to get into the technical uh, uh, reason for this, but but it, it has to deal with uh, estimating proportions, and sometimes you use use a, a a different kind of mathematical structure there. When you do that, actually, the the ranges actually get wider. Uh, uh, Jacob no longer is actually a uh, an outlier. Um, my typical advice on statistical analysis is if it depends on your prior a lot, then uh, then there's 
not enough data, but we kind of already seen that there's not enough data anyway, uh, but that's generally the, the case. But, but here the pattern basically holds up regardless of whether you have a kind of conservative uh, prior or one that's a little bit, uh, um, a little bit narrower. Um, and, uh, and so our conclusions don't really change, but it's just to, to point out for anyone who, who might be uh, critiquing that, that aspect of it, um, that we have, uh, that we have that. So th this has kind of been our approach and you can, and you can do this kind of approach comparing other texts. So kind of like we did with Gospel and Acts, you can, you can compare it with Josephus and you can kind of look at what counts as an outlier, what, what doesn't. I mean, the, the data set's a little, little messy, but the bottom line is that the number of names in the, the Gospels does not support any strong conclusion about whether it matches or not the kind of uh, source of names in ancient Jewish Palestine, and that's kind of the main main thing. And the only argument you can make would only apply to maybe the top name Simon. And there are many good reasons why si someone might know, you know, Simon. At, at that everything else just falls in the noise, and and essentially pulling out would go randomly would give you the same, you know, would be basically the same thing. You'd be consistent with with the uh, the size of the data set. Can I rephrase this and get your answer on something for dum dums like me? Sure. Uh, and I, I have to take it down to earth for for viewers who <laughs> might be similar to me who are like, "Whoa, there's a lot there, and there's a lot you could do with that." Right. So, are you ultimately saying, based on all the math, everything you've done with all the names, checking different sources, not just the gospels, looking at this stuff, depending on if you're conservative on how you're viewing these, like you said, or if you're more narrow in your views, ultimately. We cannot walk away based on the criteria that's brought up by Bauckham and assume that this proves historicity on these right. names and that this is somehow validating the claim of the more conservative approach of apologetics. Instead, it you know, either direction, based on this alone where we're at now, either one is plausible is the point. And we just don't have enough data to make concrete conclusions is that what we're pretty much getting yeah to? that's pretty much right i mean so so the you there, there is uh um and i think camille was going to uh present a little bit uh, uh later on the kind of the rare names there there is a um you know you can eke out a little bit that's against um you know Balcom thesis a lot of this depends on how you think the texts were generated and so depending on your model of how they were generated it may it may make some some difference mostly on the outliers but for the for the bulk of the data and everything that Balcom looked at his numbers the 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 counts are consistent with the fractions that we see in the overall text but it's also consistent with someone pulling names randomly out of a hat because because uh, it, it gives it it's, they both fall within the same uncertainty range for the um uh for the full corpus and that's and that's the you know basically the bottom line on, on that so and and that's also why it's it's kind of galling to see language in Bakum that confidently says you know, there's like, this is remarkably close and this couldn't have come in another way, right? There's just no sense of, you know, the uncertainties are pretty high here. Maybe you might want to check them. And then when you check them, you're like, it's pretty much in the noise, except for maybe a couple names, if that. And those are easily accounted for in other ways. So it's, it's but so much of it is just in the noise. It's just in, you know, no, nothing, nothing to see, nothing, nothing to see here. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Do we have that. any questions? Do we have any questions from the audience? I'm sure we have. I've got a few super chats, but they get into names. Are you done with the presentation? Uh, no, actually. It's a, <laughs> well, yeah, we have. More. Yeah, we have a lot. We, we, a lot more. We have to kind of play play it by ear. I would say in terms of what. Yeah, I mean, I think the bulk, other than the kind of the, the the rare names, things on the tail of the rare names, other than that one, I think that's the that's the primary result that kind of is a little bit against Balcom. Uh, and that's most of, I think, the rest of what's what's there, if I'm remembering right. I mean, there's a lot of places to go into it, but I think question, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to have a hard uh, deadline in, in a short while. Uh, so I'm not going to be so able to, to Do we want to it. cover... So do we want to cover the evidence of invention? So kind of the some of the things that 
or maybe go against his thesis. I, I was hoping you correct. would. I was hoping we yeah, could. Yeah. So I, I so like I like we got this far because what I really want to just say to people who are viewing so far is that when you hear people argue using Richard Bauckham's work, just go ahead and send them this video and let them know like, hey, you can't use this. Like you don't understand. It doesn't help what you think it is. It's not going to do what you think it's going to do. In fact, I was hoping you would have some defeaters uh, to his ideas that help us to understand, is there clear invention? And I want to ask the question, but leave it to the to the apologist and those who might be swayed by their persuasion. If we see invention of any names in these Gospels and Acts, if you are convinced once you see some of this, you should ask yourself, are there any other? Could it be more? What are they doing? If there's any invention, even a single one invention, why? Why would the author make that up or invent this character for a narrative? And if that is the case, it's kind of like McDonald's thesis. This is not, I'm not trying to argue that his whole thesis is the case of so mimesis to Homer and the Odyssey and the Iliad and such. Well, he doesn't do the Iliad so much, even though he does see some comparison. But he says, like, once you see the camel's head, right, he thinks that there's more there. Um, even if it's like cultural motifs and things. So that's more like Litwa. But anyway, I, I just, I hope people will ask that question as we're thinking of these names. And if they are invented, what's that do to the historicity argument here of trying to say this is history and what actually happened? Anyway. Okay, so let's just plow through that. Uh, that's the last section of the presentation. So um, basically we, what we find out is that the sample size is not great. <laughs> which means like a lot of the very strong conclusions in the chapter are actually not supported. And what's, what's really spicy about this is that given, even given that, when you gather the data and you use the appropriately robust statistical analysis, there are some things which are like sus, right? What I mean specifically is rare names. So rare names are defined, and this is how Bokam defines them. Your, th those are just names that are only ever known to have a one user, right? Uh, there are four in Gospels and Acts in the contested sample. How likely is it that there would only be four, given how often first century Jews in Palestine had a rare name? Well, it turns out it's very, very unlikely. Right. So this is the distribution of if you do these like dice rolls, how many named characters with a rare name you would get. So the most likely, the most probable outcome is that you would expect to see in the Gospels and Acts sample about 10 rare names. Right. So in the chart, in this distribution, that's the tallest column. Right. So this is the name, number of names that you would expect to see. And this is the percentage of how likely that outcome is if Volcom was basically correct, right? So if Volcom is correct, you would see about 10 names. Now, getting less or getting more gets progressively less likely, right? So these bars are getting smaller and smaller, and the percentages are basically lower and lower. And four is the number that we actually observe in Gospels and Acts. So what, what's marked in black is what we get or less. Not very likely, right? Could be a random chance, but it's interesting. Hmm. Conversely, some of the most popular names in the contested sample are actually overrepresented. So this shows Simon. And again, this is the number of Simons. And this is how likely you are expected, or how probable it is that you would get a given number of Simons when you roll these dice, right? That are like weighted to correspond so that the si size of the side or how likely it is that the, uh, a given name would show up is like weighted proportional to how the how popular the name was in the contemporary Palestinian Jewish population, right? So for the name Simon, you would expect like the most probable outcome is about three. So in, in like when you roll these dice many, many times in about 20% of the cases or the simulations, you get three Simons. And again, it gets small. If you get either more or less, it gets pro uh, proportionally smaller or larger. 
But the problem is, is that in Gospels and Acts, we have eight Simons, which is actually a lot, right? So the uh, bars in black show the actual observed uh, number or more. So again, not very likely. And what's shown here, the white bars, this is the range of values that is consistent with randomly picking all the names in Gospels and Acts out of a hat with absolutely no information about name popularity whatsoever. So if every single contested character in Gospels and Acts was invented by in Antarctica, by people who had no idea <laughs> about like how popular Palestinian Jewish names are, you would get either zero Simons or you would get like at most one. The, the probability that you would get two is like very, very small, right? This is because you have a lot of names to choose from and you have only a relatively small data set. So, you know, like at most you would get one. It's, it's unlikely that you would get more. So if you notice, this outcome, so zero or one, is not very likely. You know, like if you add these two bars together, the percentage is very small. But the actual number is even smaller, right? Like the pr probability for the actual number is even smaller. So the most extreme negation of Bokam's hypothesis, the situation in which every contested Gospels and Names character is invented by people who had absolutely no idea how people are like Palestinian Jews are named, that outcome is less likely than what we actually observe in Gospels and Acts. Because we, we observe the opposite extreme, but that opposite extreme is less likely than just everyone being invented. And this is true, but to a less ex uh, degree with uh, James and with Joseph. So three out of the five most popular names in Gospels and Acts are overrepresented. And the rare names are underrepresented. The one million dollar question is, what explains that? Because if Bokam is correct, well, basically what Bokam imagines doesn't offer any explanation, right? Because if everyone is historical, this would just have to happen by random chance, which is not impossible, but it's not very likely. So his thesis like can't offer any explanation, right? Just would have to be random. But I can come up with an explanation, and it's this. The reason why the most popular names are overrepresented and rare names are underrepresented is precisely because what I was saying the whole time. People who invented the names were more likely to know the popular names than the rare names. So it's not surprising that in the sample of the contested characters that might have some invented characters in them, you would get overrepresentation of the most well-known names and underrepresentation of the least known names. That's, that's exactly what you would expect, right? And that's what we found in the data. Yeah. If I may just, just, I think this is really good what you guys are doing here. And I want to ask, maybe Paul can comment on this, but like this is purely name counting in the source materials and trying to see how that works. This is not even factoring in the narrative, the context no, of no. what we're reading, how it looks like literature. And I mean, literary, not literal history. Like all of that is irrelevant and we haven't even got there yet. That's yeah, yeah. pretty interesting. Yeah. Like one other thing that you can, one other thing that like, if I was, I was actually trying to think if I was a Christian apologist, like what would I do with this, right? And you can, so you, you can always basically do the Morian shift, right? So you can, you can, uh, you know, like one, one philosopher's modus ponens is another philosopher's modus tollens, right? So I would say, okay, we have too many assignments, which means we need to redo the process of identifying who is who in the New Testament, right? So what I basically need to do as a Christian apologist is to get the number of Simons down. So I need to say, okay, some of the people that I thought are two different people are actually the same, right? And the same with some other names, right? But the problem is that this is, this is going to get, uh, th th this is going to probably be inconsistent with uh, the contents of the narratives, right? Like there are boundaries 
when it comes to who can be identical with who in Gospels and Acts, right? Like some people just can't be the same person because the, the narrative, like what, what is said about them in the text is, uh, doesn't permit that. So I think like Christian apologies insist that, you know, there are no contradictions and everything happened more or less the way how it's reported. They already have a lot of work they need to do in harmonizing all of these narratives. And this is another thing that they need to keep in mind as well, right? That like, if you harmonize the gospels the way that you do, and you get too many Simons, that this, this is an issue. You need to conflate some of them together. But it may be, I don't know, I haven't actually done the work. This isn't actually impossible. This, this isn't actually possible because you would need to conflate people that clearly in the text are meant to be two separate persons with, uh, with the same name, right? I don't know. Like th this is the best that I can. Yeah. I have to offer, and it doesn't, of course, uh, fix the underrepresentation of rare names. You just well, like, that, can't do anything. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's that's actually. I think I think the rare names part is actually more persuasive, because uh, and, and I'm kind of in some ways reminded of uh, if you are, you know, if you compare, say, say two 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 students have taken an exam and they both have very similar correct answers. Um, that's not really great evidence for collusion, but if they have very similar strange mistakes, that yeah. is evidence for collusion. So if you want to say that the uh, people had to be there to get the names right, then much better evidence would be having the rare names correct in this distribution rather than the popular names because everyone's going to get that right. And and mm -hmm. so in that in that sense, I find that the 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 underrepresentation of rare names is 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 much more damning for saying that this is not invention because those are exactly the names that that you wouldn't have if you were away from the area and were inventing names. You would have more likely the popular names, and you'd overrepresent them because you have them, right? You know that's the uh, and and so that's uh, uh, wow. that's why I find that the rare names part is really the, the part where you're like, okay, you know, if this really, if this distribution really did match what was historically there, then you'd expect it to match here of all places. And this is where it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Like I, I wasn't, I wasn't like really surprised when we found out that this is the case, right? Because like, <laughs> come on, no. like, have you read the gospels? See, that's the point I was getting yeah. at when I was saying you're, you're dealing with names. That's that's all cool. Right. We haven't even made it to like how are what what do they look like? What's happening in these texts? And that's a whole different that's a different question, as you guys both said yeah. early on in this presentation. But I think that just adds more icing to the cake. So um, but yeah, yeah continue. Yeah. We have questions we'll get at the end for the viewers. So feel free uh, to super chat your questions. I have two more slides and we are done. Okay. So the last thing uh, that I want to mention is actually, th this is something that hasn't been published yet because we just ended up with too much content for one article. So I'm <laughs> just decided to, 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 to split it and do, uh, do two. So, okay, you are watching this, you don't really get it, but your immediate thought is Camille, the easiest way how to test what Bokam is saying is just like get some different ancient texts other than Gospels and Acts, other than the Bible, right? And see how well the name distribution lines up. Because if Bokam is correct and you take a different literary work that has a lot of invented characters in it, the distributions shouldn't line up, right? So can't you test, can't you test it this way? That's like the most straightforward, like that's the thing that you would think of right away, right? So you, why do you have to do these weird like dice rolls and you have to imagine like 400 sided dice and each like side is a different Hey, don't pass off my story. work there, Camille, come on. <laughs> no, it's just like <laughs> trying, to, trying to keep it basic, right? So yeah. what, like, let's, let's just take some different texts from the ancient world, we have a lot of them, and let's just take texts that have a lo lot of invented people in them and let's just compare the, the percentages and compare the distributions, right? Like if Bokap is correct, Gospels and Acts should be super like nice and everything else that has a lot of fictional characters in it should be kind of trash, right? So this is what we did as well. Uh, this is actually something that uh, one other guy in 2014 tried to do. 
He took the Proto Evangelion of James, or the, the Infancy Gospel of James, and he looked at name, personal names of people who are invented in that literary work, right? Because it takes place around Jesus' uh, birth and around in his um, early life. And they sh there are some named characters that show up that are invented because like nobody thinks that the Proto Evangelion of James has like historically reliable information. <laughs> Uh, but it's in, it's a good in comparison because the people there that are invented are people who fit all of the criteria for Bokan selection. So they are first century, they are contemporary with Jesus, obviously. They are Jews and they are from Palestine. The problem with that research, and this is something that Bokan criticized, is that the that sample size is very, very small. I think there is like eight people that are like that, which means you can't really do anything with it, right? Like you can't, okay, the names that are selected are names that Palestinian Jews actually had, and they are not like super popular names, but they are not super rare names either. And what we basically did is we built on that research and we improved it. And the key insight is that in order to get larger samples that have sample sizes similar to the sample size of the Gospels and Acts name, is to combine multiple extra biblical texts together to create like a textual corpus. So we basically took the canon of the canonical Gospels and Acts, and we created a different canon that has a different composition of different works so that the whole package has a lot of named first century Palestinian Jewish characters in it. It's, it's not a very easy thing to do, because if you think about it, uh, a lot of the extra biblical Christian apocryphal literature is either fragmentary, so Gospel of Peter, we have like one page, right? It has some personal names in it, but we are missing like, I don't know, a, a large percentage of the gospel. So we can't use that for comparison. Uh, some of the early Christian apocryphal literature is not narrative. It's just sayings like Gospel of Thomas. So it doesn't have almost any personal names in it. And most importantly, a lot of the early Christian apocrypha takes place outside of Palestine because it's like acts of apostles or martyrdoms and stuff like that that takes, that takes place as Christianity spreads uh, elsewhere in the world. Like um, acts of Thomas takes place in, in uh, India, right? So you're not going to have a lot of Palestinian Jewish personal names. But we actually managed to find some apocryphal works that have a lot of first century Palestinian Jews. Specifically, we uh, constructed uh, a, let's say, alternative canon to the biblical canon that consists of three works. Uh, Clementine Homilies, which is like an early Christian novel. The earliest recension is the second century, I think. And it names some companions of Peter, and they are Palestinian Jews. The second is Acts of Pilate, which has a lot of personal names, actually, because it's written to give an impression that it's like a court proceeding or court recording or court transcript. So it names a lot of witnesses to various events in Jesus's life. So, for example, this is, I think, where the names of the crucified criminals come from. In the Gospels, they don't, are, don't have any names, but here they are given names. Uh, or, for example, you have recorded names of the shepherds that were attending Jesus's uh, birth in the Gospel of Luke, who are also not named in Luke. And everyone understands that these people are either these people or these names are, are invented. And the third source is a historical work by Solomon of Bosra. It's called the Book of the Bee. Uh, it's, a, it's a weird name for a historical book, but I, I think it's an allusion to like the Old Testament or something like that. But what's important is he's a he's very late uh, historian. He's from the 13th century, but his uh, historical work actually uh, compiles a lot of different traditions about names of first century disciples of Jesus and other people. Right. So even though he's very late, he's like a really good source to use. And then we actually realize that hey, there is another uh, body of ancient texts that has a lot of named uh, first century Palestinian Jewish characters in it, and as a Talmud, right? Because, you know, like a lot of the rabbis and their uh, disciples and stuff like that are uh, from the first century and they are from Palestine and they are Jewish, obviously. And it uh, seems that the Babylonian Talmud is better to uh, use than the Jerusalem Talmud because it's bigger. 
So it's got more names in it. It's also later, which actually works better because you would think that uh, the more you get removed kind of in time from the first century, the less well the distribution of popular names in that body of work should line up, right? Because over time, people would lose kind of the notion of which names were popular in the first century, so they would be more likely to get it wrong. And you can see the sample sizes. So in Gospels and Acts, we have uh, 53 contested characters, which means uh, uh, 53 contested name occurrences, which means those are the names of people who are not externally attested. In the Christian Apocrypha canon, we have 80 contested characters, and 52 are fictitious. So here in this corpus, almost everyone is fictitious. So almost none of the people who are first century Palestinian Jews who are mentioned in these three apocryphal works actually existed. Some of them did, like uh, some of the characters who are named in Gospels and Acts, for example, uh, some of them who are not named in Gospels and Acts, but almost everyone is fictitious. And in the Babylonian Talmud, and I didn't know about that before, you actually had ha, have quite a lot of uh, fictional, name, fictional people, fictional names as well. Or at least, like, those are people who, rabbinic scholars and scholars who, like, take uh, the Talmud uh, critically, think probably didn't exist, right? Like, if, you, if you go ask an Orthodox rabbi, you might get a different answer, but we are just uh, taking the, the critical scholarship position. So... If Bokam is correct, the distribution of name popularity in Gospels and Acts should look very different from... Oh, you're muted again. It's the demons. There you go. I think... Oh. There you go. Am I supposed to speak in tongues? Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're not doing it, so it takes. Amagashima <laughs> patata. Stay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so ju just to reiterate, like if Bokam is correct, there should be some noticeable difference here, right? Like the uh, names, the, the sample of names from Gospels and Acts should look noticeably different, because it's the only, supposedly, the only textual corpus that doesn't have very many invented characters in it. The other two, textual corpora, should be out of whack, much more than Gospels and Acts, especially the Apocrypha, because out of the 80 contested characters, 52 are actually fictitious, right? So if Bokam is correct, their name distribution should be like all over the place because a lot of those characters were invented and they were invented who knows where. Some of them might have been invented in Palestine, some of them might have been invented in the diaspora. Some of them might have been invented like hundreds of years after the first century, especially some of the people that are mentioned in the Book of the Bee. Same with Babylonian Talmud, right? So what I'm going to do now, and this is what I did in the Bologna video, I'm going to show you three charts. Mm -hmm. They show the same information. One of them is Gospels and Acts, and the other two are going to be the two other textual corpora. I'm going to an anonymize them, and your job is to tell me which one is Gospel and Acts. Because remember, if Bokam is correct, and if Gospel and Acts doesn't have very many invented characters in it, and if this is a good methodology how to discover the presence of invented characters, one of these three charts should be noticeably different. So let's do it. Can you tell me which one is Gospel and Acts? Are they like I are they like radically different? And, and let me just get this straight: the the diamond at the upper end is how much it's represented, correct? In this in the corpus. Uh, yeah. So that yeah, okay, that's a good point. So the the diamonds are the actual number of uh, how many people have the the given name in the given textual corpus. And so, for example, here, like in this corpus, which might be gospels, but maybe not. This, there is this many uh, Simons, right? I, I took the, the actual like axis out because if I kept it in, it would be too easy to guess which one is Gospels and Acts. Well, ju and and just to be the, fair, that bar, is it the same number across all three graphs? No. No. Okay. No, it's it's okay. relative that, that to the number. It, of, oh, yeah, gosh. that makes it even more difficult. <laughs> even more difficult. But, but the names are the same. 
okay? The names are the same. Uh, and the, obviously the vertical error bar, that's the 95% interval of expected values on Bokam's hypothesis. So you can see that this guy is, for example, jo in one of the three corpora, Joseph is over uh, underrepresented because the, it's, it's, uh, there's too, too few people named Joseph. Hmm. Here, James is overrepresented. This one is nice, right? This, this one doesn't have any like over or under representation, at least here. Uh, so I don't know, like, do, do we want to take a bet or do we want to let <laughs> the audience uh, should I put a, Should I put a toll, like a one, two, three question and answer to yeah, the- Yeah, we can do that. Okay, so I'm but, gonna end uh, like, the poll. Oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Hopefully you, you see the point, right? That there isn't any detectable difference, right? Like. I'm not saying that there are invented characters in Gospels and Acts, but if there are, just like there are in the apocryphal works and in the Talmud, yeah. you wouldn't be able to discover this using, using the methodology, given how limited the data is. That's the, that's the takeaway. Uh, that's the key takeaway, right? So uh, another, another, word how to, uh, another way how to think about it is like, imagine we are living in a parallel universe where everything is the same, but Christians in their New Testament don't have the canonical gospels, but instead they have some apocryphal works that also have a lot of named characters in them. And in that parallel universe, people are arguing about whether some of those characters are invented or not. Like for example, there is a gospel that actually gives names to the uh, shepherds in the gospel of Luke, but those names are invented. And in that parallel universe, there is Richard Bokam, who's probably having like a goatee, <laughs> and he published the same book, exactly the same methodology, similar data, just with completely different apocryphal works that have invented characters in them, right? And the point is, you wouldn't know that you are living in that universe, except for, and not in this one, because the methodology just like doesn't show you the difference, right? Almost done. Yeah. Sorry. Well, the goatees give it away because if you're in a goatee, you're in the bad universe. So, <laughs> am I, I? Am I from the bad universe? I just started the poll. Let's get some votes in, and we'll come back to to seeing how many people vote. So you have a number, uh, and it'll tell me how many people actually, you know, participated in percentages of the vote. So we're we're gonna we have Brian here to help us out if we need him. <laughs> <laughs> so, and they so never did can, tell me. Can, they never did even can, I made I had to make the video blind, just knowing, just assuming. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um well I uh, should if we do that, I will have to actually reveal that, right? And I promised I won't until the second article is you published. can wait till the article's done. I think we're fine. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So yeah. let, let's let's uh, let's uh, let's um um wait for people to vote and maybe do super chats or something like that. Okay. All right. Are you, are you, so are you wanting to do supers now? Uh, yeah. Okay. Why not? Sorry. I'm sitting here. I, I think we... Okay. Let me drop this then. So are we, are we done with the, uh, graph? muted again? Oh, we lost. Okay. <clears throat> so vote now. The poll is up. I already have 32 votes. Chart one, 19%. Chart two, 16%. Chart three, 66. Most people are going with chart three. Um, okay. Uh, let's go to supers, I guess. Oh, Brian's going to have to leave here soon. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. Okay, well, let's try and get what we can. And then if, yeah. once you bounce, Sorry. you bounce. Yeah. Um, Bro Joe says, awesome jo job, guys. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much for the support. Appreciate the super chat. Bro Joe again, who is Joseph of Arimathea? Origin influence. He's asking uh, Camille and, and Brian. I would imagine. Um, I'm sure that Camille has a, a, a an opinion on this. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. This is this is one of the the questions that I would have to uh, spend like a year reading only on this, so that I, I can form an opinion, right? Because, like, is it possible that he is he's a historical person? 
It's not, not, not super unlikely, right? Like, do, do I think that he actually buried Jesus and stuff like that? Probably not, right? Or at least there's no way to tell. But I don't know. Well, I've been researching him for my paper. And, uh, and there's definitely, as you look at the stories that line up about Joseph Arimathea, the legendary development is crazy. So it, I don't sure. doubt that it's necessarily there was someone on the Sanhedrin who, you know, was named Joseph. Yeah. But even if you just go through the Gospels and do this, do the thing where you line up what the stories are about them, like it gets more and more elaborate until eventually, you know, he's conversing with Indiana Jones. So he, <laughs> he doesn't he get like he gets like breaking out of prison by an angel or something like that in some of the yeah he, he goes tradition. and he yeah. plants gardens in England that are still alive. Like it's it's a whole thing. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. He collabs with uh Nicodemus in in other situations as well. So like it, later and and I think it's yep. amazing to see that development um I think Dennis McDonald has the thought that the name Arimathea and he's not the only one who has this idea it means best disciple town or something even Bart Ehrman said this <laughs> and he you know Bart yeah. tends to like try to be more on the lean toward maybe there's a historical memory he has that kind of model and uh it, they're like eh, it's kind of coincidental that this Sanhedrin just so happens to be from the best disciple town, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, this, this is some, this is something that would be maybe interesting to ask an actual like philologist, right? Because it's it's actually very with with these, with these kinds of things, it's very debatable. Like you, you can uh, you can take the word, you can break it into the three components, and you can say, look, like Ari means the best, like like in Ariston and stuff like that. Then you have Mathetes, that's the middle part, and you have the suffix that is like a toponym, right? But actually, <laughs> you know, like a, a trained uh, philologian would be able to explain to you maybe why this isn't probably where the the origin of that name comes from, right? Maybe you would also need to do ask someone who does uh, Aramaic because it might be better explained as a, as an like a Greek version of some Aramaic word. But I don't know, like this is a, this is one of the things that I would have to like read up on. Uh, that being said, um, uh, what, what, what was it I wanted to say? Uh, no, I don't remember. Anyway, let's move on. Okay. Doc Pleroma not, what was the distribution of the name Junius after the disciple was mas masculinized? I don't know, Unius. Uh, I would think extremely rare. Yeah, I would have to check. Uh, but I think, yeah, that's uh, it's not at, at, the male uh, version of the name is not attested. So it it like yeah. literally didn't exist as a name in antiquity, and it's showing up in the ancient literature is is just the product of a masculinization of a feminine name. Because of theological reasons, if if I'm not mistaken, right? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Um, oh, I remember what I wanted to say. Sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. What, what, one one thing that's really interesting about Joseph of Arimathea is why is it the case that he isn't like in Book of Acts? Why, why is it the case that he, he isn't a church leader? Because if you think about it, like he was uh, wealthy, he was well connected. He would make a really good candidate for a like a leader in the early church, right? Um, or at least a sponsor, like someone who financed the the early church, right? Uh, which means that either he's invented or like the events are not historically reliable at all, or he died, right? Maybe he got too scared, didn't get the Holy Spirit, but it's, that's something interesting to think about. Thank you for that. MG Bilby, I believe that's Mark Bilby. About the Pauline letters, two divergent data sets, Marcionite and canonical, should be considered. See the intro of my translation of Vincent's Apostolos at Zenodo, Paul's Literary Metamorphosis. Cool. That's Yeah, I don't know anything about that. that that's something that I would have to look into. Okay. Mark, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate the support. JC says, why are the roots Joseph, Ephraim, 
and Yeshua present in the cuneiform words for crocus. Uh, this seems I don't know more like a philological Azu is related yeah, yeah, yeah. to I healing, know. salvation, Pyru is the root of Ephraim. I have no idea. Sorry, this is JC. Above my head, JC. Um, thank you for the super chat, though. I really appreciate the support. The six petaled saffron crocus that grew in Bethlehem, Ephrata, is the source of the star David. Its rosetta is the on the talpiate ossuaries of Caiaphas and Yeshua, son of Joseph. Cool. I've never heard of this. But thank you so much for the super chat. Really appreciate that. I don't think anybody here is um, acquainted with this. Gray's 174. What is the best thing you can say about Bacham's work? So best thing you can say about Bacham's work? No backhanded compliments. Sure. So I, I, I think that he's 100% correct when he says that the gospel of Matthew wasn't written by Matthew. That's that's top kick. Uh, no, that, but, but like, it's, sorry. Say that again. I'm sorry. No, I. Oh, you muted again. Damn it! I don't know what's happening. The Hamagashima. Help me out, Paul. I can't be the only one speaking in tongue. No, I. I it just went. Uh, I I think Bokam is correct when he says that the Gospel of Matthew wasn't written by Matthew. Uh, so that's one thing. And even in the article, we actually give some, like an example of something that we agree with, right? Like, um, there is this, the, 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 the famous like feature of the gospel of Mark, where, when Simon of Cyrene is introduced, he's introduced with the names of his sons, which was first, uh, unusual for people to be introduced in the ancient world. Usually when you want to introduce someone, you introduce him by, or them by the name of their father. Right, uh, and also it's redundant because Simon is already identified by being a Samaritan, uh, by being a Cyrenian, right? So it's kind of clonastic. So what explains that? And Bokam, of course, thinks that this is because Rufus and Alexander were eyewitnesses, or they had, like um, they um, reported his eyewitness testimony, or something like that. I'm completely okay with thinking that the author of the Gospel of Mark thought that his original audience would know Alexander and Rufus, or at least know of them. Like He, he would know, he, he um, expected that they would know who these people are. Doesn't explain my, or it, like not, not much follows from that, right? It could be the case that he actually really carried Jesus' cross because that's not super implausible, right? It could be the case that he just told the story about how he did that, but it, it wasn't actually true. It could be the case that Alexander and Rufus were telling the story, but it didn't actually happen. So they just invented the story about how oh, it was our dad who carried Jesus' cross or something like that, right? But I don't have any problem with thinking that, yeah, like Mark's audience knew of those guys. And that's why he names them in this particular way in the gospel. There are other uh, explanations. Like uh, some people suggested that they, those might be the names of the patrons who paid for the Gospel of Mark to be produced. Uh, some other explanation is that... Um, I've heard that there's other Alexander and Rufus. Like I've heard that... Uh, who was it? I think it was Chrissy who mentioned this. Something to do with, uh, you know, not dying on the hill, but that there was uh, other author, uh, elite or educated author who's named this or something in the first yeah one. i think i think i know what you're talking about yeah it, it, it might be possible that they were for example like church leaders in the early church and this was a way for them to get like recognition or like some some kind of claim of authority because there is a person named rufus who is mentioned in the letter to the romans and there is a debate whether he's the same person as uh, rufus in uh, mark or whether it's just two people who had the same name, right? We will never know. This is one of the things that will never be answered, probably. But, you know, like, th this. Is, so this is something that Bokam says. I don't have any problem with that. Uh, yeah. Uh, I would be probably able to think of, of some other things. Uh, he, he, for example, says that, like, there's this famous fragment of Papias where Papias suppose, or it's, it's quoted, right? So Eusebius says that Papias says 
that he heard from the companions of the apostles, uh, from the companions of the disciples, and then he uh, splits them into two uh, groups of people. Jesus' apostles, who include like Matthew, Andrew, and some other people, and then Jesus' disciples, which is John and Ariston. And what's really interesting is in that fragment, the way how uh, Eusebius quotes it, he uses aorist, which means uh, a, 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 a verb form which is used to talk about the past when he is talking about Jesus' apostles, but he uses the present when he's talking about the other two disciples, uh, John and Ariston. And Bokam says, well, this means that the apostles were already dead, but the two disciples, John and Ariston, were still alive. So basically, if you translate it into English, he says what the apostles were saying or said and what the disciples are saying right now while I'm still alive. And from that, he says, well, Papias didn't actually live in like 130s or something like that. He wasn't contemporary with uh, some other uh, early Christian authors, which is usually the, taken to be the case. He actually lived much earlier in like 80s. That might be true. Like th this is something that I maybe want to look into because I know that in Greek, uh, whether you use the present stem or the aorist doesn't necessarily have to do with uh, temporality. It might have some other like communicative functions. And also the problem is that we don't actually have Papias' work. We only have the fragment quoted by Eusebius. So maybe something got mangled in the reproduction of the text, right? Uh, or it's a, it's a paraphrase or something like that. But I would buy personally, like I, I can imagine being convinced that, yeah, actually Papias was alive in 80s and not in like 130s when there were still Jesus' disciples alive who were like talking to people passing information and stuff like that. That's like, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Paul, do you have any questions for Camille or anything you want to bring up? Cause you've been such a gentleman hanging out with us. And well, I'm just, I've been absorbing as with even just with my video, I am just a pleasure. I have the pleasure of being a front row student in all of this, but um, no, I don't not, nothing new to add there. That was, okay. that was, yeah, that's great. Well, I, I'd like to bring something, Camille, to your attention to get your thoughts. You, 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 you created a canon to try and compare the names, um, and and I guess like I already can hint that where you're going to go with this, even if I don't know who whose graph is what. Um, and by the way, I might as well end that toll just just because people who aren't watching or just now tuning yeah, in. Yeah, I think we gave it away, unfortunately, with with some of the information that we showed uh yeah. before right so yeah it's the it's the third one mm -hmm. but if you if if you didn't watch the 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 presentation from the beginning you wouldn't be able to guess right uh well i yeah. just did it and, and so that it shows uh chart three 58 percent chart one 23 percent chart two 18 percent but um i don't want to get lost in the weeds on that because i know that you're you're going to have the publication that's going to dive deep into this but I feel like there's overlap in how you could approach this kind of material with names the same way the undesigned coincidence conversations we've had about looking at other materials. I feel like it's a little different though because the corpus we have in the New Testament, we'd have to find another corpus that has three other dependent, definitely two other dependent works on that earlier material that we can actually see and go, okay, hold on. This is a fair analogous situation in comparing Mark, Matthew, Luke, John, um, and then of course, Acts and other material. But in in some way, would you say this work overlaps what we're trying to do by using other materials? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like a lot of this stuff is... Um... Oh, you're muted again. We gotta hex the devil over here. I hate the Satan. Get out of here, Satan. Leave. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, like what what's often the case is that uh th there isn't enough comparison done on these kinds of hypotheses with other ancient texts, right? Like for example, Bokam 
Well, one of the other uh, arguments that he makes in the book that has to do with personal names is that he notices that in Gospels, people are often given a personal name, even though it doesn't, like them being named in the text, doesn't serve any function. So normally when you're writing a story and you have a character and you're deciding whether you are going to name the character or not, you give them a name if it helps the reader or the audience to kind of orient themselves in the in the narrative, right? So if the person shows up often, you are more likely to name them because that's like useful for orientation, right? If you had a large number of characters who are doing things, interacting, but they are all unnamed, that would get confusing, right? But then you have texts like the Gospels where people often are named for no apparent reason. Like it does, doesn't serve any function. And this is true about Gospels and Acts, but it's much more rare in uh, recognizable fictional ancient works. Like in novels, it's much less often the case that people are given a personal name for no obvious reason, where it doesn't like fulfill any function in the narrative. Where you do see people be given a personal name for no apparent reason are like historiographical works, right? Uh-oh. Muted again. I think it's a power to your mic that it does that, but go ahead. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so like you, you'll see this much more often in ancient Bible. Uh-oh. I don't know. Nope. Something's up. We can't hear you. Uh-oh. We need everybody in the chat to start fighting the demons. Please right, we need to start praying. Speak in tongues for us. We got to see those tongues text. I need to hear it. Come on, people. The so one the of the things this sparks in my in me is like, what are the other? I need to start thinking about and cataloging what are some of the other quantitative things that apologists go out there and say, and it would be just great. Uh, masters or PhD fodder just to try and even recreate the numbers that are used, just like these guys were doing. Yeah. They're just the first step was, well, can we even recreate these numbers? And and even there, like if it turns out you can't, well, then apologists will stop doing it. But we yeah. still have apologists yeah. claiming that Ron Wyatt found the Ark of the Covenant. So are right. the <laughs> so what <laughs> are we gonna they do? were already they were already claiming that in the fourth century? <laughs> oh, okay. Cool. So, so um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so what I wanted to say is like, not enough comparisons are made with other ancient literature often, right? So, what? Why is it the case that in the Gospels you have so many people who are given personal name, even though it doesn't function, doesn't serve any function in the text? Oh my gosh! This is the same spot it did this last time. Something about the words he's saying that it's got to be Satan. He knows. Or, as or, we have a friend here, the angels, yeah. Richard Bauckham is blocking his Wi-Fi from a van outside. Mm. That makes a lot of sense. That's uh, that's more, that's believable, actually. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> Although the tech, the IT in me is as a goal. I'll try using my uh, phone's data. Maybe it's gonna work better. You think it's the internet? I think it's no. The power I think it's thing. just because. But your picture, your your visuals were always perfect. Yeah, it everything was, was the, fine. It was just that the mic would go silent. I think it was his uh, power getting to his mic, and Streamyard does that. Yeah, the phantom power part. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> This is getting this good is and juicy. Good and juicy. Oh, listen oh, to myself. Oh, listen to myself. <laughs> in, in echo. You the man. I'm worried here that Camille is going to tell us that this is evidence that the, the Gospels are not <laughs> fictional. <laughs> I knew you were going to. I knew you were going to say this. Because, I knew it. Because now he's saying that in fiction, only in only in a real book do you randomly throw in the names of people that are inconsequential. That's true. That is that is true. 
I I think I love what he's doing and that he took the time to do this. Right? Gosh. There's a, he also we've talked about this in private about potentially figuring out a way to put him uh, a project together where he's going into other works that could be kind of going into the undesigned thing again, but we're dealing with clearly fiction and right. uh, you know having a really good analysis that does this that just breaks down over and over everything that keeps getting brought up by apologetics just gets toppled over when you scrutinize and critically analyze this stuff. So the other chart I'm definitely going to dig into is that actually his chart of uh, which books have been most cited. Cause that's can you hear interesting in and of its own. Yes. We yes. Can we hear, hear you. Uh, how is it? Yeah, that's, is that uh, not as good, but yeah. we'll deal with it. We'll handle it. Okay. Yeah, I, I would need to probably leave and reconnect because for some reason my headphones are not picking up the 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 sound. Okay. But if you're good, we are fine. I think we can um, deal with it as long as you can handle it. Yeah, yeah, I can I can handle it, no problem. Yeah. Um so what we were talking about. Um yeah, so undesigned coincidences, right? So here's the thing, right? Uh, so I, I would be able to write a book that would just uh, basically get rid of the apologetic forever. I have to pay the best research project for it that you can probably like think of, right? Because what you need to do is basically what we did with the names. You find some ancient works that are clearly fictional and you just look for undesigned coincidences. Uh, so let, let's look at like pedographic literature, right? So literature that this is basically about Greek and Roman myths. And you need to find texts that are reasonably long, so they have like comparable length to Gospels and Acts. Uh, they talk about the same events, so you can actually have these interlocking uh, coincidences, right? And if they are like dependent or the people who wrote them knew about each other or they had certain traditions and stuff like that, that would be great. And it actually exists. And those texts are Greek plays, specifically tragedies, that deal with the same uh, myths, like Electra or uh, Oedipus, uh, Antigone, and so on. Because in some cases, in those cases, we have uh, Euripides and Sophocles, or like Euripides and Aeschylus, talking more or less about the same events around the same time, around the same characters, and stuff like that. So all I need to do is basically sit down go through these uh, texts and find all of the different undesigned coincidences. And there's going to be a lot of them, like dozens. And the reason why is there is going to be a lot of them is because the way how the methodology is set up by the DM group is that every time you have uh, some information that's found in one text, but not in the other, that comes like an, as undesigned coincidence, right? And there is going to be a lot of it in these tragedies because they there is a lot of background knowledge that the authors assume the audience is going to have, and they don't have to explicitly spell it out. So they will make allusions to like, oh, this king ruled here, or this is like some different character did this did something else in, in a different myth and stuff like that. That's just going to create massive amounts of undesigned coincidences if you apply the same methodology consistently. The only problem is, is that in the next like five years, I have zero time to work on this. So yeah, if someone wants to give me like $5,000, then I will just postpone my PhD for like a year or two and I will just write a book. I but would like start that GoFundMe, Derek. I know, I thought about that too, but I also, you know, I know a lot, maybe we could put something together, but I also feel like it might be good that you get your PhD, get it over with, and then, and then here you are, you know, tackling, you, you can get oh, endless right. projects. You know what I mean? So, I would want to- 2027 is the year where, I, I already promised James Fodor that we are going to write a book about the resurrection together when we both have like PhDs, right? So I'm probably booked, booked for, for more than four years now. So- All right. right. Well, yeah. so then if any other research students, PhD students are looking for a project, Absolutely. Yeah, I'm telling you, like, my experience is if I postpone something long enough, someone else is going to look into it, right? So already, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Tripp reviewed the book, excellent stream, right? And also James McGrath, 
is apparently working on infants and relatives of John the Baptist in the apocryphal works. Mm -hmm. And he's uh, using a framework which is pretty similar to Angels and Coincidences. And what's really spicy about it is that, yeah, he's finding in these apocryphal works things that look like undesigned coincidences in Gospels, but of course he doesn't from that conclude that, oh, this must be historically reliable, right? right. No, he just concludes what everyone else does. Maybe these things are interdependent. And that's when, why like one text mentions one detail, another text mentions a different detail, and if, if you put it together, you get like a more complete story, right? Just literary dependence or like shared traditions, people telling the same stories and stuff right. like that. I think that's it's so interesting to see. Um, it's a complicated thing to deal with, like to get into as like regular people are not going to dive into this names. That's why even scholars like the you know, they're, they're not doing what you just did with Bauckham's name stuff and how this does not help eyewitness at all. In fact, I want to ask you just a little deeper on this. Why did why would you jump to a conclusion that something is eyewitness? There's other explanations that could be even before you jumped all the way to eyewitness. You see what I'm trying to get at? Like, even if you grant some of his like uh, this somehow proves historical. Why can't this just be, hey, this is a story that was already being told around or, hey, we have a oral tradition that goes back. Why do they have to make the strongest possible conclusion? Because even Bart Ehrman thinks there's memory, right? That's not eyewitness, but that there's memory of, of traditions floating around. I think everyone, including the most literary types like Robin Faith Walsh and others, will say, hey, there are stories floating around. No doubt about it. That's, in fact, why they created this literature to begin with. It was a popular story, and they wanted to narrate it. I don't know why they would jump to that unless there's some other motivations. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, this, is, this is something that I was talking about earlier, right? So it's really interesting in Gospels and Acts, you get a lot of people who are given a personal name for no apparent reason, like it doesn't serve any function. You don't see it in ancient novels. But you do, do see it in ancient like histories and biographies, right? But so that's interesting. That's actually like a, a that's actually a really relevant and interesting observation because you can legitimately ask the question, okay, why is in this as respect, why are the gospels more similar to histories compared to ancient novels? Where Volkam loses me is when he says, oh, it must be because these people are eyewitnesses and they were like certifying the their testimony even after Jesus died and they were like distributing these stories and retelling them and stuff like that, right? Because I, I've read the Jesus and the eyewitnesses a long time ago and since then I've reread it several times. So now there is like some part of my brain that has that information stored. So when I'm now reading some ancient text, I like evaluate the text against what Volkan is saying in Jesus and the Witnesses. So I keep noticing when I read some, like, I don't know, biography, oh, this character is named, but there's no reason for it. So why is that the case? And it's never because they were the eyewitness, right? Like, for example, I recently read um, uh, Anabasis Alexandru, which is by Ariane, which is one of the extant biographies of Alexander. That's an example of ancient biography that names a lot of people for no apparent reason. Like it doesn't f function in the text. He, for example, makes sure to name all of the generals that commanded the different parts of the army in the different battles. He mentions the civil servants and stuff like that, even though they don't do anything as characters in the text. There's a reason why he does that, which is like explicable given Greek cultural practices. It was a way how to Im immortalize those people and stuff like that. But not only are these people not, not only is it not the case that they are given a personal name in the text because they were eyewitnesses, Ariane actually tells us who his eyewitnesses are, which is what the author of the Gospel of Mark never does, right? He, he repeats that over and over. And it, the, the first sentence in uh, Anabasis Alexandru is Ptolemaeus, son of Lagos, and Aristobulos are my two sources. If they agree, I trust them completely. If they disagree, I record the account, which is more plausible and which is more worthy of being told. 
So in the first sentence, he's telling you who his eyewitness sources are, right? Because both of them were, of course, contemporaries and they accompanied uh, Alexander on his campaign, right? So that's an interesting observation, but because maybe Volkan doesn't read enough Greek and Roman literature, he, or he does, he's still not interested in like testing the hypothesis against other data. I mean, I could, see, know like, that. I could see how he might run to 1 Corinthians 15 or, you know, using the corpus, right? The whole totality of the corpus and go, well, Paul lists them off as people who witnessed him, you know, post-resurrection. Therefore, he then goes to the gospels and then has this bat, like this, this assumption that he's bringing to the table and saying, hey, I'm dealing with eyewitness testimony or eyewitnesses because here's this list over here that I think correlates to the characters over in this in these texts. And so I wonder if that's a, a huge driving force behind what makes that connection for him. Yeah, I mean, he gives some reasons why I think that the named characters are named specifically because they are eyewitnesses, right? Like that's that's how, that's the function that them being given a personal name fulfills in the text. But like not only, I, I don't think, it's it's not only the case that when you are reading different types of ancient literature, it's not usually why people are named when they are given a personal name and then it doesn't perform any function in the narrative. It's not only the case that it's not because they are eyewitnesses. I've never seen that actually. Like I've never seen any other example where someone is given a personal name then being given a personal name doesn't perform any function in the narrative, but they are given that name because they are supposed to be the eyewitness, right? Usually the author, or I would say almost always, the author just tells that tells you, like, these are my these are my sources, right? And they mm -hmm. they if they are eyewitnesses, the author usually says they were eyewitnesses, they were there, right? Because why wouldn't you say so? Like if you are the author of the Gospel of Matthew, why wouldn't you and you are Matthew? Why wouldn't you say the material that I'm going to give you is from Peter? You you have every reason to do that, and you have zero reasons not to do it, to conceal it. Interesting. Paul, yeah. anything from you before we wrap up? Yeah, actually, I, I've been super curious. So how many man hours does this paper represent, do you think? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think about it. <laughs> you, you have well, to okay, so let, let's skip yeah. man hours. Like, what's the lapse time then? Where you've been working on this for a year, you've been working on this for six months. You were like, uh, yeah. I, so we submitted, um, so we submitted this uh, spring, so maybe in March or something like that. And I think I first asked Brian to whether he's interested, like a uh, like a year before, like year earlier. So we we were kind of working on it on and off for a year. But we, for example, didn't do anything uh, during the summer because we are both both busy with other stuff. So I don't know how many how many hours this represents. Gotcha. Okay. Well, even that's helpful for me, just as a. But uh, it's it's, it's, it's not unusual. Yeah, it's uh, it's not unusual for a paper to take to take like six months to write. That's pretty normal, actually, in many disciplines. Yeah, it's a lot of information here. I'm glad you dove into this, and uh, I'd love to see more people do stuff like this. Um, just kind of helping people understand that what it does for me is it lowers confidence, obviously, on, on being so dogmatic or being so confident, like you said, with the language. And uh, it makes me want to evaluate other avenues. And I can't wait till your next one comes out where you're actually diving deeper and in, in doing this with another corpus in depth um i'd love to do one where we could do a follow-up even talking about this but like going into all of the names that you're convinced based on your research are fictional but i don't know if that overlaps with your second your next uh, article or not no uh, we, we don't do any any of this work because like i <laughs> i i have no way of knowing right right you can't tell. One thing that we kind of briefly discussed in the in the article, but we didn't do anything with it, is that there have been a lot of different named characters in Gospels and Acts that were suggested by scholars to be given a personal name because it's Catholic, basically. So it like the name has some meaning that corresponds to what that character does. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But so so we just like list some examples. 
as much as many as I was able to find. But like a lot of these arguments are super not convincing, and I'm not I'm not personally convinced of any of it. To be honest, it's possible, especially like the probably the strongest arguments are when there is a connection to a character from the Old Testament, right? So if someone in the Gospels and Acts does something which is kind of similar to what someone in the Old Testament does, and they have the same name, then maybe like you can make an argument, right? But it's it's I don't know. <laughs> Well, I That's loved how this was worldview independent. Like what you were doing, you weren't saying you weren't trying to say I'm looking at the same data and I'm just going to interpret different to flip the worldview, which is always you know can be valuable. But yours are really like just the question is: Is this a good way of knowing? And like, can we learn what you're attempting to learn if we apply it to other works? And like that is so much more valuable because it it just it doesn't yeah. it doesn't depend on your worldview at all. Just, I love what you're saying annoying. here, Paul, because this is the point about becoming more open-minded and flexible and understanding not everything, like getting a, a awareness of various possible hypotheses that fit. And, and when I first met Camille, Camille did a video with me on the Achilles Hill for mythicism. And he was like, you know, coming at it and trying to, I was a mythicist when I first interviewed him. He brought up some interesting points in his charts and stuff like that. And it wasn't that I wasn't i started doubting he cracked my faith in uh, mm. jesus mythicism because he said look you can grant all of these things are myth historicists do that all the time like and i i didn't know how in my mind at the time to realize like you can have all of these things potentially be mythology and yet historicity still be the case but if you grant that these things are historical or better for the historicity's case, um, unless you want to throw an in interpolation or some other ad hoc, I would call it, uh, proposition in many cases, then you, if, if any of them are historical or better suit the historical model, then technically that works against mythicism. So you can have all these things. And my point is, is like your worldview can be straight, straight up atheist. It doesn't matter. You can be anti-theist. It does not matter. You can walk away and go, characters existed. People existed. You could even go further and say, it's a memory. You could go even further and say, someone documented what they think were really accounts, as you've talked about, Paul, with like the brain and how, you know, are they tripping? Is there something happening? Is a post-mortem, uh, you know, trauma and experience? You can go any of these routes. It doesn't have to be all fiction. And I want to teach people who are skeptics that maybe fit into those camps that I came from to be more nuanced and understanding. Even if you grant these things, it does not draw that conclusion. So we need to be more open-minded. I did have one question, Camille. Um, you, I think I sent you the video I did with Michael Koshinosh. On what was it about? About Acts, where he goes into the name Aeneas. Oh yeah, the, 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 it's possible is one of the people that we cited for that because that's like that kind of lends itself to that kind of analysis, right? It, it, it just Paul, it, you probably didn't watch this, but man, if you that's go it. back and watch this, I think you're gonna really enjoy what he does here. He takes that approach, like I said, all these names things that they're going into, they're not like it's the case being made by Camille. A whole nother article could be made coupling this into. What is this literature doing? It still doesn't mean there wasn't a guy named Aeneas. But what happens, in my opinion, is the probability that this guy actually existed at this pivotal moment in the narrative, and that this is historically, right after Paul is changed from Saul, which has Mimesis connections to King Saul chasing David, and he's it, like almost verbatim Mimesis in a way where he's like, why do you pursue me? That Paul, Paul or Saul, Saul, because it's not Paul, it's Saul, like King Saul's chasing David, why do you pursue me? Right after this pivotal Acts chapter 9 scenario, Paul goes and he he's renamed and he ends up uh, healing a woman and a man. The man's name's Aeneas. Michael Koshinosh, using Richard Perbo's work from the Acts commentary and several other people, says that this has been overlooked, how common the name Aeneas was used. And how if I bring up the name Michael Jordan, you know basketball. He's like a symbol for basketball. Aeneas is a, it, 
that name we know is like the symbol for Rome in a way. It doesn't mean there wasn't a guy, but like you can't get any more Rome than Aeneas. And so his name pivots in the narrative at a perfect juncture where it now transitions to Cornelius and salvation being brought to the Goyim, to the Gentiles, to the nations, to Rome. And it's like it's like this perfect narrative pivot. And so he points out, and then you also have Jonah's narrative imitated uh, in this situation. But I, I think that it just helps make you realize you're not dealing with literal history. Even if some of these people may have existed, he thinks it's unlikely that this guy named Aeneas at this moment in the, st in the story ends up playing a role. It it's the same problem with um, Troyes, I think it's called where Dennis McDonald talks about the we passages and people go, this is a companion. And it's like, actually, when you look right when the we passages come up, the, the, is it the location, the geography Camille is, is Troyes, which is actually ancient Troy, but yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the Egypt. yeah. it's so interesting to see how I like it. It makes me love the story even more, but I think people are missing how these geographies, how these names may actually be, thrusting the narrative even further into a great uh novelish epic in a way uh so it, it just it's really cool stuff if you haven't checked awesome it out. i'm gonna look i have something to watch tonight yeah i'll send you the yep. link do that uh, camille you you deserve the final word you put so much work into this man like i, I think we have um, a couple of more super chats i think like two oh do right? we yeah, yeah, I'm glad you're watching. <laughs> oh, what is the genre of Mark? Well, that's a good question. Beards, probably. Uh, the, 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 the closest comparison that I've been able to find in like ancient literature to Mark is probably some of the lives of Aesop um, for a number of reasons, right? So yeah, biography. It's, it's weird, like for a number of reasons, and it would be really interesting to find out why. Probably because the person was super talented, but not very well educated. It's very episodic or something like that. But yeah, like in not, not in terms of content, but in terms of structure and stuff like that. Lives of Iso. So uh, pro probably the author of the Gospel of Mark knew about as much information about the historical Jesus as the authors of the lives of Iso actually knew about Iso, right? Hmm. <laughs> Who lived in? He he is placed to like the sixth, sixth century BCE, so su super remote past. Probably nothing, almost nothing that we know about him is like historically reliable, right? He's usually taken to be an actual person because of reasons, uh, but yeah. Huh. Thank you, Grays one seventy four again. Do you think Jesus mythicism or traditional authorship is more likely? Yeah, that's a good question. So if you think, um, it depends on which like um, hot take on Jesus mythicism you have, right? Because I, I was actually thinking what would be my uh, mythicist, like my best mythicist theory. Uh, but if you, I wouldn't probably go the route of the celestial sperm bank thing, right? I would maybe go Gnosticism first or something like that. Uh, that like Jesus is actually, a, uh, yeah, whatever. So, but if you if you think uh, Richard Carrier's uh, hypothesis and the traditional authorship, then I would say probably uh, like if if the, the thing is that like if Richard Carrier did you mute it, it did it again? Oh me? no, you're here. You're here. Yeah. Okay. So if if what, what Richard Carrier thinks is what happened. That would be exceptional, right? Because we, we don't really have any examples of the specific thing that he's imagining happening, right? For numerous reasons that are like too complicated to go into. It's not impossible, but it's not very well attested, right? Like, and the, the comparisons that people give, even uh, Carrier himself, there are good reasons for thinking that they are not actually like really good comparisons, right? Like, if you think that Jesus is a uh, Good, uh, a, a good uh, figures to compare Jesus to are people like Heracles, Romulus, uh, Dionysus, and stuff like that. Ask yourself when they are depicted as living, for a century, a generation before the earliest accounts we have about them were written. 
Not really, right? Uh, so that's uh, mythicism, or at least Richard Carrier's theory. When it comes to traditional authorship, for at least some of the Gospels, I actually don't have like super uh, hard, I, I don't actually th don't think that it's super uh, implausible for some of them. If you take into consideration that the canonical Gospels that we have today are probably patchworks. So they were like put together in many different layers of editing. And what we are looking at is like a final product that came out of a black box that we don't, can't really see into. Uh, for, for example, um, the Gospel of John, very famously, seems like the final chapter was added, maybe the, the introduction was added, the Logos theology was added, and then it seems that like something fishy is going on inside the narrative. So some people think they can see the science gospel in, inside it, right? Then of course you have uh, the synoptic gospels where you have Q, uh, you have some additions and stuff like that. You maybe Marcion was actually correct. He wasn't a liar about where his gospel came from. So maybe Luke that we have isn't actually uh, like a unified composition. Maybe that's like a, a rewrite of a previous gospel. And if you think all if you take all of these things into consideration, it's not actually super implausible that some of the documents that are kind of behind the gospels that we have today in the early stages might actually come from someone who was like contemporary and knew Jesus. Like for example, what Papias says uh, matches what scholars reconstruct to be Q much better than the Gospel of Matthew. So maybe Matthew, the apostle, actually existed and maybe he wrote down some things that Jesus said. That's not impossible. What Papias says about the authorship of the Gospel of Mark lines up with uh, the speeches that Peter gives in Acts. And a lot of scholars suggested that, you know, there is a lot of Aramaisms and stuff like that in those speeches. So it looks like there might have been like a document, speeches of Peter, that the author of Acts used and incorporated into his narrative. If that, if that is true and that document existed, why not think that it was actually written by Mark who knew Peter? not super implausible, right? Or maybe, like, the way how I think the, the we passages might have ended up in, in Acts is that there was a narrative about Paul's missionary journeys that was written by someone we don't know who, that was written in the first person, that mentions some of these place names, it mentions uh, traveling, uh, you know, by, uh, by a boat uh, from town to town. And the author of Luke Acts maybe in the second century, maybe in a, in a polemic against Marcion, just took the text and incorporated it into the narrative. If that's the case, I have absolutely no problem imagining that narrative was actually written by a companion of Paul. I don't have a problem with that. Right, but that's pretty far from what I think most people would call traditional authorship, right? Like I'm with you on like multiple sources and could some of these sources be legitimate eyewitnesses yeah. that is not the same as saying traditional authorship is john wrote this yeah no 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 no, no. you know be, be, so. because you have to remember like you, you, just the recent discovery or the, the recent publication of the uh, oxyrhynchus fragment with uh, that has you you know what i'm talking about right mm -hmm. the second century fragment that's like a mix of uh, matthew luke and the gospel of thomas it seems that this is, of course, second century, maybe like late second century or something like that. But it's, I, can, I, I imagine that a, a lot of other scholars have, a lot of other scholars, because I'm now one of them, have, have mentioned that probably this is how these things were originally, like this is the material, right? Like when, when Justin Martin says memoirs of the apostles, that the gospel, like he says something that sounds like some of the gospels that we have, but he calls it memoirs of the apostles. The, right. Greek term that he uses is like a technical term for a certain type of document. And it's not that dissimilar from what I can imagine was how the like how early material about Jesus was circulated. So people had like different lists of sayings, maybe some narrative material, they were free to uh, edit it, change it, uh, expand it, mix it up, right? And eventually, 
out of that process that was like very uh, creative, dynamic, it took decades. Eventually what crystallized are the texts that we have. But it's not the case that like a guy sat down and in like three hours wrote what we today have. As right. The right. That, well, I'm on, I'm on board with that. I'm just saying that, you know, the, what when I talk to people in my evangelical circles about traditional authorship, authorship, they're still on board that like Moses wrote the Pentateuch in right. that kind of fashion. <laughs> right? yeah. So yeah. I'm, I agree with you, but it's just depends. You'd have to actually define what traditional authorship means. I guess. And, and and this is my my pushback isn't that that couldn't be the case. I don't rule it out. My pushback, and this is what I had a conversation about with Bart Ehrman when he started getting into oral tradition, and you know this stuff might be a memory or it could go back, like. Allison does and, and, and Bart Ehrman, it's not that it couldn't, I mean, I get it. Cause I did a video series with Allison and I called it, did it happen or not? Do you think this is historical? Like meaning it has a memory or do you think this is fictional? And we went through each of the uh, gospels and I even got into the letters of Paul to get his thoughts on the eyewitness thing. And he didn't get my angle. I was bringing in Richard, uh, per, uh, Richard, um, sorry, um, resurrection and reception, uh, you know, bringing in the idea that the eyewitness list would have been inventive in some way based on other eyewitness models that we have about the Caesars, et cetera. So it would have been known you need to have a list of eyewitnesses in order to be a cult worthy of being recognized because that's just the, the modus operandi of other cults. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so I used that model and he didn't even know what I was saying. Like even Allison was like, oh, I've never really heard people argue this point. And I'm like, I think it's worth bringing on the table. I'm not saying it is the case, but if it's not even on the table, what are we doing? I don't think scholarship in New Testament studies is actually doing like the classicists mm -hmm. are doing. So the the point I brought up, and then I'll shut up, is that I said maybe some of the stuff's a memory, but I don't think that's provable until we have other sources to show so or like to prove it because yeah. I brought you, you up – go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. You, you know what's completely crazy to me? Like – Dale Allison is one of the best New Testament scholars that's alive today and is, if not the best, that like out, one out of three most competent scholars when it comes to the Gospel of Matthew, right? But so so he's probably read everything that was that's relevant to the Gospel of Matthew that was published since like 1700s, right? I, I, including things in Latin, German, French, you know, all of these, uh, these, these works. But I was really surprised that like apparently he has blind spots when it comes to other stuff. He he didn't know what Kalirhoa is, or he didn't like appreciate what, what the argument is with the divine translation and bodily disappearance and stuff like that, right? Right, right. Yeah, it's a, you, there are scholars that are super focused on one specific issue, but you have to be a little bit of a generalist, right? Like you have to read other stuff, primary literature from the ancient world, right? Because that's illuminating. Yeah, I didn't, for example, know the hermetic literature until recently, and I was assigned some of the 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 the, the shorter texts from Corpus Hermeticum. I was really surprised how like relevant it is for understanding early Christianity. I think, at wow. least as, as as comparative material, right? I like most New Testament scholars don't know that it exists, right? They don't know what it is, what what's the history of the tradition and stuff like that, but. In the Hermetic tradition, it says that Hermes, the the the, the Greek god, mm -hmm. was a teacher of Moses. But actually, Moses got all of his information from from Hermes, right? So that's like what what uh, what uh, Philo does with Plato, right? He says, yep. "Oh, Plato got all of his information from Moses." Well, this is. Oh, you muted! Damn. Now this is good. I love, dude. And by the way, uh, Paul. That idea, you know how you've covered all this, like how do we explain 1 Corinthians 15 and I witnessed yep. this and who saw it first and all that. You know, you're playing in the sandbox and I love that because I could play in the sandbox too. I could play in that box, this box. But <laughs> one of the things that's never on the table that I don't hear among a lot of the skeptics is is um, resurrection and reception in early Christianity. Like this is so important in my in my opinion in terms of at least bringing to the table and I, I don't really hear the talk about all of the various eyewitness claims, meaning the, the way that it's modeled is it's almost like a Hall of Fame thing. When you have a person who becomes deified, 
they become, they have an apotheosis, they become deified. It's almost necessary to back up their deification that there's, there's testimony, eyewitness testimony, even fictive accounts mm. of people from way, way in antiquity had eyewitnesses like Romulus. Look at how they formulate it. They invent not only his apotheosis, ascension narratives, the whole nine, they also invent eyewitnesses. And so I wonder, I don't know this. It could just be like the models you've been playing with, that there's some psychology here, that there, that there's some actual hallucination model, or it could be this or that, or it could be one guy hallucinated and then it went, became contagious and everyone else. All these models are plausible. But what about the model of saying they invent a creative eyewitness claim because they know all the other right. models. They see what works. They know Romulus. Look at that. He's a god. Karenis. Like everyone knows that's what you do. Why aren't we considering that this is what's happening? We actually, we actually have that. We, we actually one, have one example like that with, that we can positively show, right? Do you know uh, Seneca uh, wrote a satire of he, he was making fun of divination of Claudius? I think in English it's called like a pump, pumpification of Claudius. So he he does he dies, he ascends to heaven, but because he's like incompet, incompetent and stupid and stuff like that, the <laughs> gods end up rejecting him and he gets turned into a pumpkin or something like that, right? Oh my God. But the thing is that the, the way how Seneca writes it, he writes it as a satire of a historical work that's describing what actually happened. And in the opening section, he makes fun of how historians work. And he says, look, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to tell you who my eyewitnesses are. Like, historians never, never do that. Like, fuck you, basically, right? <laughs> then he says, OK, I'm going to tell you. There is a guy, and he gives the name, who is like a, he, he, is, he collect, collects toll from uh, Via Appia, from the Appian Road that goes from Rome to, to, to Capua, right? right? And because he sits in the toll booth all the time, he has the, like the perfect vantage point. So he, who can see, he can see all of these like dead emperors ascending to heaven. And he's my eyewitness source for this because he saw the soul of Claudius like ascending to heaven. And he actually heard all of the conversations that were going, going on in heaven. So he actually invents this eyewitness, of course, didn't exist, just to make fun of the fact that when these apotheosis accounts were being told, both about Romulus and about the deified emperors, you had to have an eyewitness, right? Mm. Uh, so that's really that's really funny. And, and specifically makes fun of the fact that like this is a historiographical practice mm. or like a historiography adjacent practice. That's the yeah. point I'm saying. Like if we can go different paths with you, Paul, on this, because this is stuff you do when you're engaging with yep. Christians, but it's like, what's Paul doing? <laughs> if not trying to like validate his gospel and his claim to apostleship, he's like, he's doing multiple things, but like, well, how do you become, well, why should we listen to you? Oh, he appeared to me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there, there are also there are also two two other interesting things about that specific text in Seneca. So he calls this is in Latin, so it's not in Greek. But he calls the news about Claudius is that the good news, the, death the good news. So that would be like a functional uh, Latin equivalent of Evangelion. And he says that when Claudius died, uh, jurists who had to spend his reign in hiding because reasons, right? Because his incompetent, incompetent rule and stuff like that. When he died, they finally came, came out of hiding and they looked like corpses coming out of the grave. Oh my God. Gospel of Matthew. <laughs> oh, I love finding stuff like this because it's not, I, I want to praise, like you said, Allison, and then I'll stop. I got two super chats. We, we really should try to wrap it up because yeah, God, I we'll, go soon, yeah. yeah. And I'm, I apologize, Paul. Um, just pointed out, Allison, when I asked him about Dennis McDonald's mimesis or any of that, he said, to be honest with you, I've never read it, and I've never thought to compare those things. And he said, I was trained in 1976 or something. He said, I learned Greek, and that was it. I've only focused on Hebrew connections. I've only focused on Dr Jewish material and never considered the Greek world. That's why I love classicists. That's why I love what you're doing, Camille. You're doing a bigger picture. Um, all right, question, guys, and we'll make this one easy and simple. Thank you, Grays. Do you think Jesus mythicism or the resurrection is more likely? 
think Jesus mythicism. Yeah. Un I, unless you, you have like a like... really, really specific, well, I don't know, I would be probably able to brainstorm some model of the resurrection that would be <laughs> more probable. I don't know. But yeah, um, Jesus mythicism all the way to the yeah. mega. <laughs> Constellation Pegasus, I can't get over how the gospels contradict. The creator of the universe can't get his stuff right getting these books written. That goes for the rest of the books also. Didn't feel it important to keep it free from mistakes. I was ne I was never religious, so this like this. I'm not really thinking about these kinds of things, right? We, you know, because there is source criticism, there is forum criticism, there is mimesis criticism. But what I do is content criticism. So if you want to know whether something happened or not whether it's like history or not, you have to ask the questions like, what, what is the actual content? Like, what are the events that are transpiring in the narrative? Are there people working on water? If yes, probably didn't happen, right? Like, you sometimes it's like, I don't know, like Craig Keener wrote Christobiography, where he uh, talked about, like compared the, the, the gospels to the biographies of Galba and, and these kinds of guys, right? And it's just like very often when that kind of work or apologetics gets done, people seem to lose track of what the gospels actually depict. Like what is the content, right? You, you focus on names or you focus on eyewitnesses or traditions or gospel authorship and stuff like that. Just like read it. This is not rocket science. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Constellation, thank you for coming in. I understand where you're coming from, my friend. And most, I would say, people who aren't coming from our angle, they don't see the problem. They'll allow it and then somehow still make abracadabra happen. I personally don't. I don't I'm more of the I'm more the guy who realizes like, whoa, these cracks in the in this text literature makes me question. And, and the questions lead me to more questions and, and my, my epistemic bar, it, it, it never comes near the floor. Uh, you know, and, and <laughs> I'm bringing that up because of Paul. Paul made Yay. that famous, man. You really did. Uh, low bar bill. Yeah, low bar bill. Victor Engelman says, could the name Jesus, Yeshua, Joshua, including the great warrior Joshua in the Old Testament, come from the Hurrian war god? I'd probably butcher trying to pronounce this. I don't know. It's it's like um, the theophoric in Hebrew, right? Uh, that would be a question for um, like an Old Testament scholar. Maybe at, at Matthew Munger might, being a philologist, yeah, yeah, yeah. have an idea or something. So, yeah. Um, thank you, Victor. I sorry if we don't know the question. Yeah. Go watch Pologia's video right now. You have to. It's like sexy is all get out. Um, I'm dating it today. My wife said it's okay. <laughs> and, uh, I'm not kidding. That's one of my favorite videos so far on your channel, brother. Well, and it's only 37 minutes, so it's got that going for it. It is. It is. <laughs> Check him out. Subscribe to him. Camille also has a YouTube channel. It's in the description. Cam and Cam. If you haven't subscribed, do so. If you haven't got the article, check it out. If you can afford it on Brill, um, yeah, there's a lot more, I'm sure, in the weeds, the details in the article you can cover. And be on the lookout for the upcoming ones. I can't wait to see what you do. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Paul. I'm going to go ahead Later. and close this out. And uh, let's do Matrix. Or no, let's do The Horseman. It's apocalypse time. So, all right. Never forget, we are Mythvision. Vision.